Welcome to the Faded ARPG Podcast, episode number 130. We are, I would say, in week, what is it, five or six of the LE cycle, but we're already basically in week minus one of the PoE hype cycle or minus two. So this is going to be a hybrid episode where we talk about the top end of last epoch, and we're going to talk a little bit about the teasers for Path of Exile as they've come out so far. And um, as always, this show is done with the generous support of you guys. Everyone who bought a purchase subscription will be shown on the end screen as always. So big shout out to the supporters. And without further ado, let's get our co-host Baylor. I always say Baylor. I got in the habit of saying Baylor, but everyone else says Baylor. So I'm going to try to say Baylor, Mage. How are you doing, Baylor? Uh, hello, I'm doing fantastic. I just had a little mini holiday for a week. This is the first time I've done absolutely zero work for like in like six years. So now I feel great. Sounds great. And we're also joined by guests today. We got Snoobay85 back here, who's been delving into the top end gameplay of Last Epoch. Nice. Nice. Yeah, you can say that. Thanks for having me. Wait, Balor Mage? I've been calling him Balor Mage the whole time. I can't even tell Are the you difference. Serious? No, I, Are I, you serious? Are you serious? I use both. <laughs> <laughs> I use both. It doesn't matter. Okay. It's fine. Okay. okay. And we I'll, get... just re I'll just rewire my brain. No problem. <laughs> we got someone else who's making his first appearance here on Faded, someone who's massively impressed me with the, the knowledge that he shared on the Epic Epoch podcast. So let's hope to delve into deeper discussion with Snap today. Welcome. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good, guys. Thanks for having me on. As this is your uh, first appearance on our Faded podcast here, would you like to uh, give yourself a little bit of an introduction? Tell people what they should be knowing you for if they don't know you yet. Yeah, I do. Um, I do group play shenanigans and PoE, um, and then also last epoch this time around. So, uh, if you don't know, I play with Empyrean Gaming. Uh, you know, he he joined our group a few years back, and you know, we've been mfing doing shenanigans ever since. Um, and I've been making like YouTube videos about what we're doing every league, and yeah, that's that's where I'm that's where I'm from. And we're doing the same thing in last epoch when the uh, 1.0 release happened this past month. Wow. Uh, and, and I'm told you're the brains of the operation, like you're doing a lot of the heavy lifting in regards to planning. And uh, um, I mean, yeah, I, I do all the builds every league. I mean, we also have input from tons of people in my discord. Like I, of course, it's not just me putting out all the builds and that kind of thing. I have a huge you know, group of local friends that are like all putting an in input and we're kind of perfecting the builds in that regard. So that was that was actually something I was talking about on stream yesterday. People were saying like, "Who are the best build creators?" And like, do you think? And I'm like, I don't think there's a single build that's like a really good one that's ever been made by one person. <laughs> like, I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. Yeah, there's a lot of things to miss, right? Even if you like, yeah. you have a really good concept, and then you can be a refine driving and, person. Yeah, you can like, refine and iterate on it. Right. Yeah, but then you look at somebody else's profile, whether that's on PoE Ninja, and be like, oh, that's a really good idea. I'm going to steal that. Right. And you, you incorporate and you show that. show it to some friends, and they go, hey, what about this? Or have you thought about this thing? And like it just... And it all starts always culminating up. A group. Yeah. yeah, into the perfect you thing. Just, you just made me realize I, I, I typically go for the kind of low-end concept, but then also really refine it to something somewhat akin to great. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily like the tier of build, but just the concept of like you have a build concept, yeah. right? And you can start with an idea and you try and execute that idea. But then if other people start to pick up on that build or that idea, right, you can start to pick up little tidbits here, tidbits there to improve it that maybe mm -hmm. you didn't think about. And that's, I think, what's something really cool about PoE. It's like the complexity of those builds that you can kind of pick up little pieces from other people and improve your own build. Yep. I'm, I'm experiencing so far the same sort of thing in LE as well. Probably not quite as complex, but... I'm definitely getting the same thing of like, I'm trying to build a build, but then somebody else is like doing something similar, but a little different. And then you're like, wait, hang on. This bit fits in with mine and it's better. And I'll pick up this over here. And then actually really enjoying that. <laughs> yeah. It, it's part of the organic process of learning all the, all the uniques, all the different things together. But it, I mean, of course, when you actually look at the entire database, it's pretty clear that it's like not even 10% of what path of exile has in terms of all the different possible pieces and affixes that could go on the gear uh but yeah I, i'm loving it too i'm with you there the organic process which is something new discovering it mm. absolutely fun 
Yeah, there's been a little bit of a, I wouldn't want to call it controversy, but there's been a little bit of a, of a conversation about this the specific topic of like no build being like one specific person's accomplishment, because there's been a little bit of a trend, I guess, in videos and in Twitter threats to talk about like X creators, Armageddon brand build or whatever. Well, I guess that's Jung Rowan if I talk about him or Armor brand. But uh, uh, yeah. It's important to point out that with a complex game such as Path of Exile, like people always, you know, stand on the shoulders, maybe not necessarily on the shoulders of giants, but on the shoulders of other people who are also standing on the shoulders of other people. And we've, we've always been in this situation that people take concepts that other people have already done and bring them to the next level. Yeah. I think it's more like giants standing on the shoulders of little people more, more often than not. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. It's, typically it's just some some person makes a build guide uh, concept halfway refined, and you know it's really cool concept nobody thought of. They got like a thousand subscribers, maybe, and then it, it get, word come gets around, and then somebody eventually in a chat says, "Hey, check out, uh, check out my build or this build," and it gets lost in translation. Who actually originally created like the content creator, like a big name streamer or something, will look at the POB of a build and. You know, it could get completely lost uh, on who did the original concept. I try to give credit uh, to people in that respect, but quite often what ends up happening is I end up giving credit to some mid-tier or high-tier streamer who didn't maybe give credit. You know what I mean? It's like the it's like the phone game. You know, you saying who mm. who made this build, and the, it, it just gets lost in the end. The best example of that is the Poison SRS build. That's like mine. Like I didn't come up with a concept. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I guess right? so. Like yeah. I, that, that, right, that wasn't yeah. made by another content creator either. That was somebody in my chat found a dude playing it on Poe Ninja, and then we looked mm -hmm. up Poe Ninja and we found four or five people who had been consistently playing it for like four or five leagues, and they were all Koreans. <laughs> and we were like, right, "This right. thing looks fucking great." Let's pull it, and we did pull it, and then we made a few tweaks to it to make it a little bit better than what they were doing. And then I was like, all right, this is a build guide. This is like a great build. Let's go. But like, it didn't, we didn't come up with it originally, right? It was just like some, these, these five Koreans had been playing it for like a year and just not telling anyone and having an amazing time. <laughs> and I actually got two of them in my chat the next league saying, Oh, I didn't know that. I'm glad you picked it up, but we hate you now because our whole build costs like a hundred chaos and now it's like 50 divines. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, oh, to be fair, if you wouldn't have done it, someone else would have popularized it. Uh, well, I mean, it, 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 that build existed for nearly a year before. But didn't it get out. like significantly better, the patch that you decided to play it because of some no. changes? Didn't like the, wasn't there like a no. despair, despair change or something like that? nothing nothing important enough they had been okay. played for a year it was fantastic and a, and a 100 chaos build that no one knew about for nearly a year um, i'm interesting that the difference between like that and poe with something like you know poe ninja where it's super easy you have so many index profiles and can flip through them but then in something like le where there isn't necessarily that kind of functionality i mean you can pull yeah. up people's profiles right but there's nothing you that has know that clean, person. you can't just go yeah, farming for builds. You have to know the account name and look at look at that person. Yeah. And I think to a degree that's going to slow down the evolution of builds a little bit in Last Epoch. I think in Poe the the builds gets optimized so fast just because of that concept you guys are mentioning, where like somebody has an idea and they see and they they you know implement some other concepts into it and it gets more and more refined and that causes builds to get super optimized really fast um, in Poe because mm -hmm. there's so many people that can come together and start looking like looking at every piece of the build and optimize it super quickly. But that's not necessarily the case in LE because it's not some sort of character index yeah. like Blue Ninja. For that to happen in LE, first a decent sized content creator needs to pick it up and make content about it to bring it to the map because you can't just find it yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, just a little personal story. I, I went into LE blind and I was just blindly playing through and, and ended up started using a build or developing a build blind. And, and of course, somebody in my chat said, Oh, you're doing you're doing this such and such build. I'm like, am I? <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, but you know, I eventually went to look up. On, it was a Max Roll Dragon Song build, so I went to look up on look it up, and I said, oh, oh wow, I guess I guess I'm kind of smart because I just randomly almost not exactly piece for piece, but definitely scaling it and and copying the skills 
with unwittingly, you know, in, in large part. And it's like, well, uh, okay, I guess, I guess this isn't really my own build anymore. Dang. Huh. Same thing kind of happened to me. I had, I had four out of five of the same skills and like 80% of the same spec as a as some other warlock. But I went in like yeah. I had never looked at a single warlock thing. I just made stuff up. It turned out I'd just done a damned variant instead of a bleed variant of a warlock. Mm -hmm. I didn't well, look any warlock is... build up until like level 95. And then I was like, hmm, this is very similar. <laughs> At least it's not like D4, where there's so little complexity at play that you make your own build and then everybody starts dogpiling you for copying X and X, like referencing what Catmaster said, you know, some streamer already made a build back in the alpha phase of the game, you know, and he, there is just no opportunity to make a brand new build in Diablo 4 because there's no, no options for it. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of choices in Ellie, but unfortunately, Ellie exists in a state right now where a lot of the choices are just bad i don't know how else to say yeah. that like they're just not yeah. great but it suffers from that problem and i'm sure like that'll just come with time they'll they'll iterate and refine on that for sure um but the balance right I, now is like is something else in last epoch i think yeah but the second you you take that argument to po poe i mean you get the same phenomenon still so the, the, the entire melee archetype is like there's something interesting in poe time. um and this kind of can can come into a topic of discussion where uh, you know the Top end of builds in PoE don't maybe matter as much as it does in Last Epoch because of the way corruption works. And what I mean by that is mm. a build can top out um, at a certain point in PoE where you know I can kill all the Ubers and I can kill you know, I'm smashing T16 maps, right? And like that's kind of the ceiling of my build. Yeah, like the clear speeding can increase whatever marginally, but in Last Epoch, if my build is two, three, four, five times stronger than your build, I'm going thousands of corruption, right? And that's giving me a direct. Right reward for that but in poe it kind of tops out in a sense uh, so I'm, I'm curious to you know hear your guys' thoughts on that like I, I and i also think that um that's partially the reason why people are so upset about the bugs you know that was driving like the warlock course, controversy yeah. and that kind of thing because these strong builds can go so high in corruption and get a reward versus in poe you have builds that kind of top out and it doesn't really matter that their builds are stronger because yeah, they're going to be able to clear the content anyways. how much reward you can get in PoE. Like this is just this is it. This is as hard as you can make your map. This is as most rewarding as you can make it. Well, so affliction guess... league is, is a bit of a yeah, wow well. to, to what you're referring to. But let's, um, let's don't worry about this league. <laughs> when different. with Uber, I, I guess when when they revamped Delirium, with Simulacrums also that was that obviously mm -hmm. raised the ceiling dramatically. So that certain that way fewer builds you know popped out as as you said. Uh, but I do agree with what you said, generally speaking, yeah. And uh, the people got a lot of problems with the scaling, outrageous amount of scaling with some of the bug builds. I guess they're getting on that. They, I saw just a post recently, they nerfed Ballista's Radius, Explosive Ballista's Radius in LA, which uh, yeah, but pissed I, a lot of people like, off on the forums. <laughs> yeah, I feel like LA is just going to have a big problem going forward in regards to balance because of corruption existing in the game, right? If there's some really problematic broken build in PoE, like, yeah, you're going to go one shot the Ubers versus, you know, maybe killing it in 10 seconds with like a top tier build. Like, and, but in Last Epoch, if that build is taking you into way higher corruption than other people, like, that's a serious issue, I guess. Whereas if that built, broken build exists in PoE, it's way less problematic, I think. So before you go too far into that, just in case, because there'll be a bunch of people who don't know, um, Snap, how high in corruption did your group get mm. at the end? Uh, we stopped at 3,000, not because our builds were, like, failing. Um, it's just we could not do the grind anymore. It's a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, and, you know, 3,000 was just, like, a nice stopping point. But our builds, in the current state of things, could probably go well into, like, 10,000 corruption, if I had to guess, um, just with how the, the builds were performing. How much more uh, time is that to get, like, at that point to get 1,000 corruption further, say? It's around... 50 corruption it's like 50 to 70 corruption i think uh like every hour or something like that so it's you know going to 3000 corruption is like a 50 hour grind ish Oof. i'd be curious uh since i made it to a thousand corruption solo so i got to see you know the difference between like 100 to a thousand in terms of the loot or whatever uh what is the difference between a thousand and three thousand in terms of scaling of loot and the incentives to continue pushing um, the one thing I did notice is I saw a lot more like double exalted items dropping, like the, not like an insane amount, but I just noticed them a little bit more frequently. 
Um, that's one component of it. Uh, Exalted's, my personal observations was uh, for uniques, I would drop, if I were to drop a unique, there's a much higher likelihood that that unique had like one LP, but a lot of the time it's just trash. So like, I don't think that that was super impactful. And I think that's honestly the least impactful portion of corruption is how it scales the LP on uniques. And then oh, the okay. most the most noticeable thing for me was the gold, the raw gold that you generate um, from just pushing uh, the, the monoliths. For example, um, the end chest, the highest amount of gold we got out of a single monolith chest at the end was 182k gold out of one chest. And you know, if you're doing a lower monolith like at a thousand, you might see 30, 40,000. So it's like at 300, you get about 20k. I think it is. Yeah. Or is it yeah. 2k? It, ha- it has really, really it's high variance. Low. I don't know why the variance is so uh, high on that. Yeah. Sometimes I'm getting 2,000 and sometimes I'm getting like 200,000. And I don't right. know why that has such high variance. I never really paid attention to the gold I was picking up. It always seemed to pale in comparison to the gold to be made in the Merchant's Guild. Uh, like it, it, They just didn't sync up well. It's that way in every game that has gold. Anyway, it'll be that way in PoE 2, I'm sure. We'll not really care about the gold on the ground uh, at any point outside of like the campaign, I guess. I definitely cared about the gold on the ground when I was pushing corruption the first like two weeks. Um, I'd say like around half of our total income was from gold on the mm. ground. Including sales, including like everything. It was about half, maybe half the gold we were earning was just picking up gold out of the monolith chests and out of the the echo bosses at the end. I think gold on the ground is actually pretty big in Ellie. It's just that unless you're really paying attention, you don't notice because you're not picking up half a million gold at once, right? You're picking up sixty thousand as you walk through a map and twenty thousand at the end from a chest, and then you run twelve maps and then you're like, oh, I've got all this gold. It just doesn't it doesn't come in one big chunk so it's easy to miss and without wanting to pivot to poe2 i think a poe2 gold on the ground will also be pretty useful because isn't gold gold is just the tax that you pay for instant buyout right that doesn't go to the player that sells you the item that goes to the servers it's, to the yeah, house it's basically right? favor as i understand yeah. it it's the way favor works in last epoch is it's the currency of which that allows you to trade not necessarily does really much else outside of that yeah, yeah, so that, that what I'm trying to say is you always want to pick up the item on the gold on the ground because that's the only yeah. source of generating it in PoE2. I, a little bit of a pivot here, but uh, back to what Snap's saying. I, I think it's absolutely a really interesting uh, discussion point. The never-ending scaling difficulty of a game in you know Diablo 3, you had greater rifts. I guess in D4, you have Nightmare Dungeons. In LA, you got uh, monoliths, and PoE seems to be the exception here without offering a sort of infinite scaling difficulty or, or like an arena board or anything like that. Elliot goes real hard on it, I guess, with monoliths and arena boards. Dungeons seem to be the only thing that cap out on the scaling uh, as far as endgame content there. Um, so so what do you guys, how do you guys feel about never-ending scaling content in general? That's a hard call. Because there are I mean, things I, 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 love I have about a, it. I have and a strong opinion. opinion. All right, let's go. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So it's hard because I think in Last Epoch, I felt like there was a really strong incentive to make my character as strong as possible. Um, And that was a fun aspect of the game that I really enjoyed, right? I wanted to eke out every single ounce of power and get like as much LP on every item so that I could push as, as far as possible. And that was one really fun aspect. The downside of that is the thing I pointed out before where there are extremely problematic things in regards to balance where if one build is outperforming all the others, it's going to have a huge impact on the economy, which is a super, super negative thing. And I don't think PoE will ever run into that problem because if there is a super powerful build, it's not really going to like skew the, the economy that hard, I don't think, relative to other builds because most builds can obtain like a similar level of clear speed maybe or something like that, right? So... That's like the two things. And I think PoE actually had like the infinite scaling thing with Dell, right? If you recall back in the day, people were doing like the super deep Dell for fossils. Um, and that was just completely obliterated. Like they just removed that from the game entirely because I think that they, uh, GG also identified that specific thing as a problem. Right. 
I guess when they added the, the 10 additional waves to Simulacrum, I guess that was for a short moment. People weren't able to get the 30 waves, but, but like, yeah, that was solved within moment, the league yeah. that they did that. So mine's like really torn because for the same reason, I really, really enjoy the fact that I'm not just like done, right? Like there's no, there'll be no point at which I'm done with an LE build unless I want to move on. Because I can just keep pushing into harder and therefore need a better character and then keep pushing again and then need a better character. And I really, 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 really enjoy that. But I think what? if that was happening in PoE, I'd be unhappy about it. And I'm trying to understand why. And I think it's because Ellie is still my side game. And so I care less about things being balanced and fair. Yeah. And more about just how I'm personally having fun. I think you'd care way more in PoE if a build was overperforming, if there was some sort of infinitely thing to scale. Because right now, like if I look yeah. at something, if I remember back to Crucible, like the exploding totem thing, it's like I didn't really care that this existed because, yeah, it's strong. Like, yeah, you're one shotting everything, but like in the grand scheme of like things, it's not. 20 div, you can kill yeah. that uber boss in 15 seconds instead of one second. So it wasn't really, it's still the same boss, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it, you're not no, making three times the money. But in, yeah, in last epoch, that can cause inflation because these builds are going so much higher under corruption and you're getting raw gold gain from being in that aforementioned high corruption. And that mm -hmm. in itself is just causing massive inflation where in PoE that doesn't really happen. I guess I have uh, mixed feelings on this too, kind of like you guys, but I'd probably lean a little bit more towards uh, favoring the infinite scaling side of things. Uh, I like it if the game has a balance in respect to in-game content that is does cap out, uh, such as, for example, tier 16 or something like that in PoE, and that also has some option. And I, I'm, I, I don't have a, personally have a problem with a leaderboard type of scenario. Uh, it doesn't have to, but I, I'm with Balor. Uh, as far as enjoying the the carrot on the stick, you know, the carrot just keeps moving whenever you have uh, infinite scaling like that. I very much enjoyed Affliction League. Uh, I, of course, I thought the rewards were absolutely redonkulous, way overscaled on the rewards. But um, at, at the very end, you know, I appreciated the fact that for a while there, I had to hold back on the Affliction Juice because the build couldn't handle it. And that, that gave me... A profound incentive to make my build stronger because I knew the rewards that waited at the end of that trail uh, once I pushed it up and was able to um, you know get as much of the yellow blue purple juice as I could to get just absolutely outrageous results and, and they sure came in the end uh, and you know I eventually did get bored with the Fliction League you know, with that much loot dropping but um, it was it was it was an absolute blast so I guess uh, as far as Snap's comments on the market fluctuations, isn't that a little bit of devil's advocate? Isn't isn't that just uh, make, doesn't that just help to make it all clear which builds are should be balanced in future patches? Because sometimes Poe, you know, misses the mark a little bit on balancing. Not exactly sure why, but Le, you know, the devs will have a much clearer picture about what builds are massively overperforming. Uh, and, and it's a massive all, honeypot, right? Easier time. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but <laughs> at least um, you know the the game is raw. Uh, that's the word I keep using. The game is raw right now, so a lot of things are kind of out of whack and balancing decisions. I I enjoy the heck out of it because you know there's no proc co. There's not many proc coefficients in the game. There's not that many diminished returns built into certain skills. Cool internal cooldowns. There are some obviously already implemented. But if I may hook in there, what is a proc coefficient for those of you, yeah, well, for well, those of that? us who are not uh, ARPG? All right. So um, technical. Yeah. For example, um, back in Diablo three, I used to play a whirlwind barb with a bunch of life on hit, and uh, I was able to stay alive because I just had an outrageous amount of life on hit and was spinning around really fast. A proc coefficient um, makes it so that the procs. Uh, happen uh, either happen a little bit less frequently than they should, or that the amount of life return is d diminished uh, with each hit. Uh, so the proc has its own built-in number. Uh, so, for example, uh, life on okay, hit so with that a faster... whirlwind ability grants you less life on hit than life on hit with a slam ability that would be a real slow hitting slam. You get all of the life on hit on a slow hitting slam. You get a tiny portion of it on a whirlwind hit. So that makes 
you know that that takes some fun out of the game. I think you could say it's a good adjustment in terms of balance, but uh, that's something that Diablo did very heavily heavy handed back in D three at some point uh, back in the vanilla times of the game, and uh, absolutely ruined um, a bit of fun on my end. So it's something I'll never forget. <laughs> but I guess uh, I'm not sure if Poe does that sort of thing yet. So not that I don't think so. Nothing, nothing like that. I guess I didn't realize how, how like old of a balanced concept that is. Do, do you think that this phenomena that I'm like talking about where people care more about like the unbalanced or strong builds was happening in a microcosm in affliction? Because affliction really did push the boundaries of how Absolutely. of how good your build needed to be to actually clear the top pinnacle like mapping content. I'm wondering like what you if you guys are like agree or disagree with the sentiment that like the community cared a lot more about like these builds being problematic or stronger than all the other ones because Affliction raised the difficulty ceiling of mapping to such a high degree. Oh, here's the thing, though. The build that I'm hearing complaints about the most personally, which is all I have to go off, right, is what I see in here, is still just people saying, I hope they nerf bows finally now, which is just a crazy concept to me because this league... Those weren't really the play. They were just like the entry level. Like you had to do like, you had to put like four or five mirrors into a bow build before it could do maximum juice. And you could just go play a chieftain. That's what like people see though. Pe people see the utter top end of it though. And everyone's that's like, why. oh, I hope they finally nerf bows. And I'm like, that's, bows was not good. Like it didn't well, I mean, carry the damage and tank. It, it was good. It's just so expensive. Things. Don't so, you think so that's like a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that it was so expensive because everyone gravitated towards it? And like, I mean, it would have no. been cheaper to do proper to do it like to do the like proper juice this league. You needed you basically had to get like a mirror fizz bow and the mirror quiver and like a bunch of really disgusting stuff because the content was too difficult. Which is. Right, I loved that. I loved that the content was that difficult. But there were other builds that could do it at a tenth the price. Yeah, and and defenses actually mattered, which which really put bows on a on the hurt mode a yeah. lot. And the Fulcrum, I think, was really the most popular build this league, wasn't it? Fulcrum Magic Find. So or when you look on when you look on on Poe Ninja, no, it was still Tornado Shot somehow. But that. Mm. All of us will be like, yeah, Fulcrum or or various Chieftain Hinakori things was so, the play, right? It but, certainly seemed like for the more average gamer who wanted to push really hard, they, they were going to go with a defensive, much more defensive build, which is yeah. honestly a flavorful difference compared to what we normally see. I, I would have, I would like to think that some people would at least appreciate a, a, you know, a different angle on build diversity. Hey, we actually I, care about defenses this time. I didn't even like Fulcrum because I didn't like the the weird bits of downtime where you had to like pay attention to like your buff and try and make sure there were like mobs left over and so, so I actually just went straight up Righteous Fire. I just made a Righteous Fire Chieftain. And I just still got hundred percent ignite chance and still pro left from the Hinakori's explosion, but I at least had Righteous Fire and a fire trap still. I, like I I did full MF, got one hundred by accident. Do like 9, 10, 12k occasionally juice was fine. There must have been something invigorating about that, using like a different skill than you normally would and feeling it like was, that is the best one. It was for, real for weird job. to be to be doing like juiced MF content yeah. and be like, I'm running around on a righteous fire chieftain. I don't know, that sounds great really. to me. Yeah, I, I can't help but feel like affliction, like with its difficulty that it brought, should be what delirium is. And I feel like delirium's yes. kind of lost that over the years. And maybe yes. it would be cool to see some sort of revisit Definitely. to the, the risk reward of delirium. Because right now, and especially with the state of eight mod mapping, and maybe we can segue into that if you guys want. The, and, mm -hmm. and the new corruption maps. Yeah, and the new notice this morning, that was a disappointment. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, if you, I mean, I don't know if they're going to be removing eight mods. Um, if you are unaware, the, the new teaser today from the Necropolis uh, Quality of Life series, right? They were teasing that uh, new corrupted map outcomes, you know, they're going to remove unID'd uh, outcomes and then they're going to replace them with a bunch of, you know, benefit, things that benefit you like quantity or pack size or effective Atlas passes. But we don't know whether or not this also uh, is affecting 8mod uh, outcomes, which is the thing mm -hmm. that a lot of endgame mappers care about. Well, unidentified was the play this league. 
Uh, at least I, I did. I felt like it was, but not by not by a huge margin or anything. You, you kind of take what you could get, right? Like for for a lot of people, would maybe take unid deeds. They would also take like really high roll eight mods. They do both. Uh, I think like both are viable strategies. But you, you know, roll if, like if, sixty maps and then just separate them into these are my unid ones yeah. and these are my eight mod ones and we'll run them and then then. Yeah. I just really wonder about uh, if they're also going to be taking a stab at that whole 8-mod corrupted map thing. And the thing that makes me think that they might is because I think that these changes are somewhat motivated by the anti-TFT movement that has you know, been sp sprouting up mm -hmm. the past league or so. And I think that a just big for portion the of... Bulk yeah, selling just, channel? just for 8-mod bulk, bulk selling channel. I think that oh that's actually... God. I actually think that this, might, this change might be somewhat motivated by that because a big... That, that is a really, really active part of like end game mapping for a lot of people selling and buying eight months very recent and, and it's really recent only in the last few, Wait, so few you, cycles yeah. you guys are suggesting that this replaces eight mod corruptions or that or eight mod corruption might be gone possibly uh, i mean possibly. We, I, the, or the way that i understand it is just that the unidentified outcome is replaced by an implicit corruption on maps like we previously didn't have implicit corruption on maps and unidentified was a a outcome for corruption that can't happen on any other items that you corrupt, right? Yeah, the, it's only on maps specifically that they are, become unidentified. Yeah, the way I rationalize this is if you're if this is a quality of life change, right? The thing that is more problematic for players while they're progressing is volling their red map and it turning into something that is unusable or unrunnable because the eight mod just went crazy. Yep. It's like minus max reflect all this crazy mods, right? And I think that the eight mod outcome is actually way more problematic than the map going unID'd. So if this is being sold or sold as a quality of life change. To me, removing the eight mod outcome would make more sense than removing the the unid outcome. But they didn't explicitly, it, yeah, they didn't explicitly mention it. So I, I guess we have really no idea. That's that's, just that's an assumption. interesting thought because I think about it. If I'm like a weak character or whatever, and I'm progressing my red maps, getting an unid map that's a huge positive. That's a win. Yeah, that's, that's a, a that's map a I already prepared that I can run. Yeah, I, I want it. It's, it's got quant. more rewards on it. And that's it. It didn't get any harder. It didn't change maps. It didn't do anything. It's just here's a little extra reward on the exact map you already prepared. That's what you want. That's a win. Yeah, but, but if this replaces unidentified, that's exactly the same with, I mean, the exception that you don't get the, the flat 20% quant from running an unid map in your map device, but you get either a 10% quant or 10% pack size or 10% increased effect of your atlas passes, which may yeah. in some situations be better than what you would have gotten otherwise out of unid And if I understand correctly, this implicit corruption also doesn't reroll the map, right? You'll still keep the same explicit mods. Yeah. <laughs> But it's I mean, just it, this is this is all a conspiracy about the whole eight mod thing. But I, I would be yeah. I would be scared if I was a you know an eight mod enjoyer for the implications of these corruption changes. That's all. <laughs> I honestly think that that would feel a little bit a little bit like deceptive almost if they like mentioned this and then did omit the fact that eight mod is gone in patch notes, right? Like that, that would this be a little in bit... character for GGG, but I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I am an eight mod enjoyer, as a matter of fact, for sure. Yeah. Uh, make a video on it every single league. It seems like how to farm more eight mod maps most efficiently. But uh, you know, uh, my approach on things like this is GGG will set the parameters, and I enjoy the core game. Whatever the parameters are is what will happen. I will run as fast as they will let me run. It doesn't mean I enjoy flying across the screen in the blink of an eye. Um, it, it just means that I will, you know hyper optimize the maps and the strategy and the, the build yeah. to whatever extent it will. And I've, you know, pivoting back to last epoch a little bit, I, I've said this on stream, I honestly couldn't believe the words came out of my mouth, that I actually enjoy the last epoch build I'm playing more than any build I've ever played in PoE or any other ARPG past. And that has a lot to do Ooh. with me trying to optimize a build and just authentically enjoying the speed and the pace and the abilities and the the visceralness of the of the build and everything and just how it plays matching the archetype is exactly as how i would like to see it and you know kind of unwittingly like you don't really realize if i could just invent a build out of thin air what would i like to play the most uh, and last epoch the build that i've played has hit the mark closer than anything else i've done i mean we're talking like blizzard sorceress hammerdens whirlwind barbs static monk twister wizards 
tornado shot, lightning arrow, poisonous concoction, I mean, toxic rain, every single build I've ever played in 30 years of ARPG games. I mean, that's, that is obviously a high, high compliment. Probably the best thing I like about the game. Do, do you um, think and, that's like particular to the build that you're playing, or do you think that also has to do with the uh, way in, that in Last like, Epoch? Well, the skills, plays. the skills, the way they link up. Uh, we, we can talk a little bit later about how Last Epoch, um, in, in its skill system, it does something that I wish POE would do, which is transforms other skills based on um, certain things. Like, in, for example, Explosive Trap can be transformed into an arrow skill. And then it can then proc detonating arrows and stuff and just weird things that seem very wacky, uh, but actually makes for some really interesting uh, gameplay option and thematic choices that kind of make sense. You know, if you're a marksman, you want to transform your throwing damage ability to scale off bow damage instead. And, it, and the skill looks different. It feels different, plays different, does different things. It's not just about transforming the element over to another thing. There's some seriously major transformations in there. And PoE doesn't have a lot of that, actually. Yeah, the, the one thing about skills in Last Epoch that I can touch on that Snoopy was talking about is it feels like in Last Epoch, every single build plays like a slam build in PoE to a degree. And what I mean by that is you have your main skill that's doing damage, right? And, and, and analogous to PoE, this would be your slam. But then you have like four other utility skills that you need to like have line up in such a way to like you know bring all of the more multipliers together right and they're all on a cooldown and they all in and, and to me it just really plays and feels like a slam build right because like most builds are gonna have one main damage skill and then four utility skills or and one of them being mobility right and then you have like some dr and it's just like the the way that they all play together it really just feels like a slam build i, I don't know if you guys yeah, it, it, the, the combo like, is, is really strong yeah. in, in LE, but that's that's on the one part, that's how the skills interact and how that is being offered through the, the character classes and the skill trees. But on the other hand, I feel that's also because LE makes it possible with the pace of combat and with the clarity of, um, of uh, telegraphing. So, right, like in Path of Exile, there's a lot of situations where you need the monsters to die instantly. Otherwise, you, you there is no way that you're going to live, sort of. At least that's how it feels to me. Are you sure that's not just the build you were playing? Because the build Possibly. that I'm playing has five active skills, three of which do damage and two supports, and I cast one. I cast one ability. I run around. There's no other ability on my bar. I actually I just, I just have transplant my movement skill and one damage ability. The procs, everything. It's all my single target. It's all my AoE. It's everything. All five skills go off based on Wait, me casting one thing. You just said transplant, so you're not talking about your Thorn Totem build. Which, which build no. were we talking about now? The, uh, the most recent one you played? Cathotic Fisher. Oh, yeah, Cathotic Fisher. Yeah, However, I, that's I then, use that but skill. You, you cast it, it casts the Chaos Bolts. Those cast Bone Curse, which also casts Rip Blood, which also casts Harvest. Like, it just everything, all of my five abilities, all proc off just casting one thing. I just a it's self comboing build. cascade of skills. Yeah, it's just a one button build. I just got a teleport and one button, and it does all my clear, all my single target, all my everything. It's great. Well, I, I got a question for you guys. Out of between D4, Last Epoch, and PoE, which game do you think offers hmm, the most flavorful non one button build options? Let's just say that. Out of last those three last, games. last epoch for sure, I, I think. Probably, yeah. Because it feels like they have every skill that's not your main skill, for the most part in last epoch, I feel like offers some substantial amount of utility. And there's really substantial opportunity cost, whether or not that's like an insane damage reduction it offers you or it's like a damage steroid. Um, I think that there's like really impactful things you put in all the other slots that aren't your main skill in last epoch. Um, and I think that's super interesting. I don't know that that sort of dynamic exists in a game like Path of Exile. Some builds do, for example, slams. And I think like, you know, for melee builds, you have like the Ancestral War Chief, like this kind of thing. But I in guess Last Epoch- strength Contagion, like- Yeah, a year or two sure, ago. sure. But you know, in, in Last Epoch, like every slot matters uh, for the skills that you're putting on your off bar, right? In, in PoE, like you could really get away with just one thing on your bar if you really wanted to. It's because of the, the, the skill system, right? Because the skill itself has its own tree and you give 20 points to an entire skill. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going to want to use it, right? 
And so, I mean, this even, is the thing that they address in PoE too, right? Where you can actually have less socket pressure on your skills and be able to support those utility skills like a lot more. And I think that that'll probably be something that'll be improved a lot in PoE too, right? Yeah, they're clearly going that direction. We've seen in all the footage. Even with my like one button build that I've designed to be one button, there's still like a bunch of choices on what utilities. There's more than one thing I could have automatically procced. There's also a pretty good argument to take one of those automatic procs away and put in an active skill that I should be using. Like, there were still a lot of choices here, even when I'm trying to automate as much as possible. Like, I'm well, still not another... positive that I have all the right skills on. Like, there might be better options. <laughs> this is another interesting debate point, I think. Um, are one button builds good? They're good for I hope game. so. Like, My is favorite. that the preferred way to play? You mean... Okay. Just in general, with ARPG gameplay, do you think should one they have one build... button builds? That's what you're well, saying. Well, yeah. Sh should ARPGs be pushing players in the direction of uh, committing to one button builds? I think Is it that should what exist. Players want. I think it should exist, but I don't know if it should be the predominant archetype or way to play. Like, I mean, there's righteous fire enjoyers, right? In Poe, they don't want to push anything. Uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, yeah. the I think that like both things should exist. I just don't know that every single build should be funneled towards having one button that just does the most damage. And I think that's just a consequence of the way the sockets and links work in PoE, right? That, that's, that's just a side effect of it. I mean, I, I in Last Epoch, I'm a Rune Master enjoyer, and that is like a 90 button build. Like I'm pushing four buttons per thing that I'm casting. It's just like the number of buttons on that build is just off the charts, but it feels incredible when you play it correctly. There's just so many things that can go right. Like it just feels. It feels like I'm playing an MMO rotation, like in a in an ARPG, and honestly, it's really really fun to play. So I I really love my one and zero button builds. They're like a specialty. I focus on them a lot on any ARPGs. I wouldn't want those not to exist. Mm. But at the same time, I don't think there's any situation in which the absolute best thing to do should be one button. Like even my automated build, I've definitely chosen to give up some power by not having one or two active support skills that I press because I've favored automation. I favored being lazy and it's working quite well. It's easily fine. I'm up to like three or 400 corruption, which isn't that high, but like, it's still smooth there. I think I would probably hit a wall around a thousand ish. That would be where I might need to be like, mm, okay, maybe I need to do a little less automation and put in some actual skills. I wouldn't want yeah, them taken okay. away, but but not the strongest in the game either, if you're going to be well, that I, simple, that, right? Interesting. We got different re representation of totally different views there. I, I want to know what Catmaster feels on this one. Oh, I'm pretty sure, like, I, I probably like, just mirror what Valor says. I didn't pay full attention to it when you started talking Valor, so I only got the last sentence. But yeah, what I would probably say is I think it should definitely be an option. I think, like, customizability of builds also to the extent of how complex do you want your build to be how complex do you want the moment to moment gameplay uh in your end game root loop to be but then also in a one button build should never be the strongest build like maybe you know for a cycle or, or a patch when something went wrong and it's cool it's the flavor of the month but it shouldn't be um a, a constant a permanent thing that that there's a one button build that outperforms builds that use more buttons I suppose. I suspect we all kind of agree that uh, a one button build should be an option, uh, but through optimizing a build, it shouldn't be the best. The best should be the one where you have to try hard the most, which would involve more buttons to a certain extent, at least uh, maybe two or three, possibly four. But uh, like Snap said, I, you know, he, he's getting a lot of fulfillment out of a correct rotation. I, I absolutely echo that sentiment. That's something I love. I remember when uh, the Monk class was released in Diablo 3, I got super excited at the thought of optimizing a rotation through the combo generator system that would uh, be able to sync up extra damage multipliers by you know timing windows of using a, you know, a finisher right after the third combo or something like that. It's really sad that they didn't really do that or they didn't push that. It was for some reason, even though that was thematically what was going on, and uh, it's one of the biggest things I'm looking forward to in Diablo or in uh, Path of Exile 2, because I think Poe One absolutely drops the ball on this. Overall, it doesn't you you don't feel incentivized to optimize two, three, four button builds in Poe, uh, but clearly they're moving in that direction. 
it's been getting game. better. I mean, when I started playing Path of Exile, it always used to be like focus on one skill gem and then six link that and make it the strongest possible. Spam that button all the time. Use a movement skill, like use your mana reservations and that's it, right? And they've been getting better at that. So a lot of people use two skills for leveling nowadays, right? You always have the, your armor brand and cremation set up or fire trap and cremation or fire trap and armor brand. Um, um, there's a, a lot of builds now that use more than just one skill and more than just uh, you know movement skill and reservations as utility, but there's also a number of interesting skills that you can use for utility. But I guess what I'm trying to say is like basically Snap already nailed it by saying with the socket system they're pigeonholing everyone into one button builds kind of because you can only reasonably make one skill super strong. But with Path of Exile two we can have like upwards of twenty six links, right? Or eighteen? How many I mean, sockets do you have? The- and also the flipping passive tree, right? Like that could contribute exactly. to having better, but, build, you know, better like, build diversity. Here's the point. It's not much of a conceptual stretch to imagine that there are unique pieces of gear or skills on the passive tree itself that say, if you take this point, it increases the damage of your other skill, X-Fold. You know, if you wear this piece of gear after casting this ability, you know, or this type of ability, whether a melee ability, I don't know, for example, after you use a melee ability, your next range ability does three times the damage or something. I, I don't know. Like it's, it's, it's not that hard to imagine coming out with gear like that. This is, again, this is kind of like what I like about Last Epoch is they seem to have more of that sort of flavor that kind of push you in the direction of actively using different skills and syncing them up. In some cases, through automating, automating them through procs, but in some cases, manually uh using them and they give really big multipliers in that respect. You think that GGG has intentionally avoided like making that kind of design? So I feel like they try to avoid skill specific like mm-hmm. uniques, especially. Um and like the thing that you're mentioning where you have like combo uniques mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. I feel like they've intentionally avoided all of that. I, I, I don't know if they've ever spoken about that or I, I actually realized in the middle of that sentence that I probably shouldn't be saying that specific skill, but rather uh, skills of that tag, that sort of thing, like fire skills or lightning skills or melee skills, or you know, so so it can cover a much more broad spectrum of of things. So it would be it would be way too tunneled to come out with a unique and say, "Aha! After you use tornado shot, your next lightning arrow does ten times damage." That wouldn't be good balance, obviously, <laughs> and that would not be good for the game. But uh, if they made it, you know, a more broad. I mean, I like the concept, right? But I, I feel like even then, what you're describing still doesn't exist in the game, really. And I feel like they've actually intentionally avoided making these kinds of uniques. But I don't, I guess I don't know why. Because it seems like an obvious archetype for like uniques to have this kind of interaction, but mm-hmm. it just doesn't exist anywhere. I think challenge is balancing, maybe. If you make that good enough to use, it becomes mandatory. And that's something they've tried to avoid actively, right? If a if you if you put in a unique that's like, hey, if you use double strike after you use bone zone, then it'll cover the whole screen and hit every mob at once. Well, now that's the only way to play it, right? And so now if you don't have that, you just don't play the ability. That's what they're trying to right. avoid. That would be my guess anyway. Yeah, I, I, again, just to clarify, th- those kind of examples are really pigeonholing, but y- you could imagine, you know, after you use... A skill with a melee tag your next range skill ability has double the aoe or something like that you know that that would allow for a lot of different options obviously something it like fits that a as lot opposed more to what you with just the said aoe 2 system of hey i use this attack it changes weapons and my skill tree and now i'm doing that and then i use this other attack and it changes my weapon back and flips my skill tree like those sort of things work with that poe 2 system man i can't wait to play poe 2 yeah i mean that that's these are things I'm hoping for in PoE. I mean, we, we get to see so, like the monk class demo. It looks like we saw kind of a lot of that sort of thing built into the monk class, if I'm not mistaken. If I had unlimited money, I'd definitely be flying to LA just to play the demo for like two or three goals and fly back. <laughs> I know me and Balor, were, were you at uh, Exile Con, Steve, baby? Me and Balor played the demo at the last Exile Con in July, right? Were you, I were you played at Exile Con in, in August in, uh, at Gamescom here in Cologne. Was it the same demo, I guess, that we were all playing at ExileCon? I, I actually got Druid gameplay. It was oh, enhanced. Yeah, yeah. I got the Druid oh, class that you did, guys didn't yep. see. 
I had shape the other, class, the other classes were reportedly exactly the same. They just got like one extra class. We didn't. I, I, I feel like I, I got to play the demo at ExileCon too. I, it was just really, you know, we're, we are all players who typically when we think of the game, we're, we're thinking in terms of end game. We're not thinking in terms of act three abilities and skills. And the demo was, it was insightful, but I got to say, I mean, it, it wasn't very invigorating, you know. Uh, definitely not the, the, the speed and skill at which we were able to move and do damage i was like wow i use this ability now oh that's cool oh wait this one's actually better okay i'll just press this button over and over. i don't know i was pretty excited <laughs> when i played it i thought it was great i don't know i i evidently played the best one i played the huntress or whatever which was reportedly the most uh, interesting and enjoyable one to play and even i thought it was a bit of a drag but I believe that had a lot to do with them just setting up the literally worst garbage tier gear and a random confluence of skills that don't even synchronize in any oh, major way. It's worse so, than that, too. Uh, um, yeah, it was just... Where, for anyone who did play it, uh, where you were set up, you'd be like, you'd have a character at the beginning of Act 3, right? And they, they set your level to the level that you would averagely be, like the level of zone at the beginning of Act 3. But they cheated the characters there. They didn't copy them. Yeah, they don't have an actual passive tree. They just gave Which it some stats. Forget about not having a passive tree. It also means that we didn't get any of the buffs from the first two acts from killing the unique in every zone that you were supposed to have. So we were all just way weaker than we should have been because there's like 45 zones worth of here's five life and 10 stats and... 15 res and like this whatever whatever the stats are for killing all those uniques because they just cheat skipped to it we didn't get any of those yeah but they also set up the characters to be of an appropriate strength like whether they implemented that or not they, they did manually tune the characters after they set them up to be in that act right and they tuned it to the point where they thought, thought it was fun gameplay and what they think is fun gameplay is well, you arriving in acts with like white gear and six levels under leveled. And, we were uh, also turned up in difficulty as well. They specifically made it like mobs hit harder, have more life, where we go because and we got the ruthless with gold client yeah. too. Because the people showing up there, just overall, we're all the degenerates. So it wanted they wanted it to be harder for us than it would be at release. They so just did it because fine. they they must have thought Ben was going to show up and they didn't want him beating the game on their client yeah. demo. Do we know what uh, the the event is? It on the it's a couple days from now, right? Do we know anything about like what they're showcasing? Is it going to be a live event? I actually don't know very much information about. It does the... say it does say GGG Live on the teasers, right? They did rename their format where they previously said reveal stream or whatever they said in the previous cycles. Now they they're actually saying GGG Live on the 21st but yeah what what do we know i think so they're doing the 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 necropolis reveal stream alongside i guess a bunch of like streamer content interviews whatever that they've mm -hmm. flown out there to la is that i'm assuming the event that they're doing i think from memory but i don't know if they posted that I don't think there's anything live. I think like tons of stuff is getting recorded and it's all going to get posted. And all the content creators that got invited will be doing recordings, but not live stuff. And then be able to post interviews and stuff. I see. So they're just pure growing a bunch of stuff. I see. I would, uh, I would, I would, I would get in the plane tomorrow if I got invited. <laughs> I want to go. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds like none of us were. No, didn't, I don't think any of us were invited. We the golden ticket. No. I mean, I don't know how this invite process works. There, I mean, there's some jokes in my personal Discord about like who's getting invited, who's not getting invited, this kind of thing. <laughs> it was, it was, it seemed to be a little random. Well, but, I, I was under the impression it might have been a little more on the focus of pr cross pollination. There's a lot of cross pollinating going on right now. So, other major content creators from different games or who are more associated with different games. But there's uh, like also they're... people invited that aren't content creators or don't have a YouTube slash Twitch presence and or haven't played the game in years that are also invited. So it's just the selection was a little strange to me. That's all. Oh, you mean like POE OGs? Yeah. I, I'm used to that. I've seen that 
the whole way through since I joined in Ultimatum League. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, a lot of that, a lot of that decision will just be how expensive is it to get somebody there, right? Possibly. Like if you live in LA, show up. Well, we, well, we don't have to pay for your flights, and we don't have to pay for your hotel, and we don't have to do anything, which means the cost of getting you there is practically free. So you don't have to be huge in value to to like be worth coming, right? It's true. Whereas if you're me in Australia, I need a if I'm going economy, it's like nearly two thousand dollars just to get to LA and back, and then a hotel. Am I generating that much money? Probably not. Am I, am I generating that amount worth of hype? Another two, two and a half grand for hotels. Suddenly, you've spent five grand for me to come over. It's probably not worth. You're worth it, Balor. Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what are you saying? Is if you lived in the it. states, you would have been invited. If I lived in LA, I bet I would have got invited. I'm I'm worth free. If you don't have to pay for my flights or hotel, I promise I'm worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so there was some information about this on the on the Preach interview, the interview with Preach Gaming, uh, with Jonathan. And I think they said that Ranger will be showcased, and you also they'll showcase the melee with WASD movement. I'm actually excited for that. I, I was so confused when I saw the Ranger trailer because the trailer they released it, it's like a 10 second clip, and all it is is the Ranger shooting like one arrow. I'm like, that's the whole clip. <laughs> I was like, what yeah, is it's this? like three arrows, but yeah, yeah. I was just like, okay, cool. It's but, just yeah. to show off the movement, which you yeah. know what I found really weird. Like, the Ranger walks uh, like with all this tension, like a sort of um. You know, SWAT team storming a building or something like that, a back and forth and walking backwards with a back to the tree and all that. And all, the entire time she has the bow on tension, right? And then the monsters come up to her and she wants to shoot a lightning arrow and then she pulls the bow back again before she shoots. It's like, wait, what? It was pulled back the entire time. Just release it instantly. <laughs> but maybe I misread that. <laughs> all right, I'm going to bring it up on stream. But yeah, in general, how do you guys feel about the WASD movement? Uh, WASD movement is that something that you guys are into? Have you played WASD? I believe like the first time I played a top-down game like this with WASD was Deep Rock Survivor, and I, I don't know whether I like the idea of doing my ARPG on WASD in the future. It's, I heard Jonathan uh, say in his interview that all the guys in the office swapped to it. Um, that was yeah, yeah. I was surprised to hear that. So and that makes me think. And I know you know at least some of them are real gamers. So uh, especially when he said he and most of them didn't expect to be using it personally at all. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, over yeah. the course of a month or two, they were all changing into it. And he's like, "That, that was sounds... really surprising how good it is." And I'm like, "Well, well, yeah, I'll give it a go." Yeah, I mean, that I was probably the biggest sale right? I, I could have gotten from that, yeah. I've I've had other people in my personal, like, sphere of gaming that are, like, they're gamers, whatever, and they just say they won't play PUE because it doesn't have WASD movement, and I just find that so bizarre. So it must be, like, a, this is like a really highly requested feature, at least for some demographic, right? So I, mean, I think it's a good thing that they're adding it. The curious thing to me that you also mentioned is that, the, you know, all of, there's some, you know, people internally in the office that just now love WASD movement after playing with it for a while, which... I find fascinating. I, I really am right. curious to see how that plays out. It, it it might be one of those, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you know it kind of thing. Yeah, I fully expect I'm, I'm to fall to in love with it myself. I'm trying to imagine, like, how, how do you how do you actually use your abilities though? If you can't press one, two, three, four, or whatever, with the mouse buttons, on... then right? Well, why wouldn't you be able to push one, two, three, four? You've got more than one finger. Well, right. I mean, you got you got your fingers on WASD, right? And, and then, then you have Q, 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 E, you R, still... very easy to push. And then you have yeah. like F, yeah. all the yeah, buttons around so, yeah. Q. Those... Like, isn't yeah. that how you play WoW right now? It's like 18 million hotkeys and you WASD Dude, I played movement? WoW in forever. I did have one of those mouse buttons I had on the left side of like 16 buttons or whatever, but uh, I didn't enjoy that. No, no, I'm I'm a uh, I'm still doing the one, two, three, four, just like we did back in D two. <laughs> um, on on a lot of the abilities, not all of them, but uh, 
Yeah, I guess so. Q E. They're pretty close. Have we missed any of the other uh teasers? Like the I know that they they leaked the flask changes now. You guys have any strong thoughts about that? The Ellie flask changing from reduced <laughs> damage to max res. That one's interesting. My first initial reaction when that happened was a visceral no, please, oh my god, how dare you nerf me? And I looked at the chart. There's a little chart on Reddit of like yeah. how the damage reductions work at different various levels, and I realized the area that I normally build builds in is like heavily in the red. Like you're going to take like 40, 50, 60, 80 percent more damage. The area I normally build Pathfinders in. But after a little bit of thinking and working around it, I, was, I there are areas where it's better. There are a lot of areas where it's better and a lot of areas yeah, where it's worse. It's if the flask is the thing that gets you to 90%, then it's totally worth it. Something else that I thought was curious was in the, today's teaser with the map uh, corrupting, there was a Pathfinder with a Mage Blood. Um, and, he, and, you know, this character has two Nebuluses equipped. <laughs> and it's so... <laughs> Presumably, it's capping, it's capping res with you know, uh, mage blood with the flask, giving me a bunch of all res, and that's running around with two nebuluses. I definitely think that's some archetype we might see in this upcoming patch. I think they know it too, with the reversion that's, of these. That's changes. hilarious because we know full well they know how to make good builds, but they yeah. only ever show good builds when they're showing off something else, and the build just sits in town and doesn't do anything. <laughs> Whenever they show off gameplay, they make shit builds. <laughs> Or when, or when they set up a, a demo client. Yeah. yeah. Like, they always show us terrible, terrible builds, but they know how to make good ones. You oh, see, but... it's not the first time we've seen them with a good build sitting in town, and you're like, yo, yo, wait, this build looks like a, like a proper good build, but it just sits in town to show us something else. The, the master almost... changes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. These are actually a big change. I don't think people are talking about the... The mass, the multiple masters in map, uh, is specifically Ooh. a big nerf for group play, and I can explain why. Is oh yeah, please. Uh, that that so, aspect of it I haven't seen yet. So there are two things in group play that you really want to avoid, and one of them is uh, Einhar in your map. Um, and the reason for that is when you're in a group, you're playing a uh, a Kohler, right? And the guys, you're leaving mobs on one HP, and the guy has a bunch of uh, increased item quantity, and he's culling all the mobs. But Einhar. Mm -hmm. Uh, can actually steal mob kills from you as he's running through the map. So it's a big no-no. Oh. It's a big no-no to put Einhar on the map. And so what you do is you try to put masters on the map that actually specifically block other ones from spawning that are that have negative implications. And Einhar is one of them. The other one is actually Alva. Putting Alva on your map is actually really bad when you're going for a ghosting strategy. Um, ghosting is still yeah. somewhat relevant, maybe not so much in Affliction, but you know the league before that, Tota, like ghosting was obviously a really huge thing, and ghosts can actually spawn inside the Alva. And when you're running a ghosting character, it's obviously really hard to know whether or not your ghosts have spawned in the Alva. So it's not great, you know, to have potentially Alva spawning on your map, which is bricking your ghosts, and then also Einhar spawning on your map, which is potentially bricking your culling setup. And now there's really no way way around that. They're just going to spawn no matter if you block it or not, and they can potentially be breaking your map. And so just the... For, for solo, uh, Alva, the Alva thing still applies. Yeah, sure. for solo players, yeah. So I don't know how relevant like ghosting will be in like, high-end mapping, magic finding, this kind of thing, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. That I suspect it'll be a bit of a stretch, probably one of those things that I might do, but virtually nobody else will bother with. Yeah, I mean, there's also the the thing to mention that these masters can take up. Um, this is a, a niche thing, but uh, I'm sure you know, Snoo, that when your map is full of mechanics, there's a lot of mechanics in your map. It's really dense with abysses and breaches and boxes, and there's all sorts of stuff spawning. Uh, certain mechanics can actually get cold from the map because there's too many things spawning. Um, and I would Ooh. imagine that if you have some stuff like Alva... Uh, that can actually take up these aforementioned spawn points can cause other mechanics that you actually want to no longer spawn. So I have um, a theory on that. I think that problem might be solved. And there's a reason for that. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> the We we know about that that problem is anchor points, right? Like we know yeah, that like there's sure. so many anchor points within a map. 
you're not supposed to be able to double up on them, although for some reason occasionally some do, and I'm not sure why that exception happens, but for the most part, they can't double up on anchor points. You fill every single anchor point in the map, and eventually stuff gets booted off the edge and just doesn't spawn. Yeah. Well, there are very specific anchor points that only apply to masters. Right? Like, the best example of this is, like, Atoll, right? Like, you run Atoll and you get, like, Sulfide or Alva. The spawn points for the Sulfide or the Alva, they're the same, and they're almost always in the little triangle at the front of the map. Right? Like, 9 out of 10 times you run that map, they're there. They're always there. But there are more spawn points on that map, way more. You can put breaches in there, they spawn everywhere, right? The, uh, they have their own spawn points that are like, these are the ones. Well, if they've given us the ability to have Alva and Nico in the same map, they can't take the same spawn points anymore, which leads me to believe that something that's happening at the same time as this is they're fixing the like that, on yeah. point location lock amount. I don't know what to call it, but like that. Yeah, I wonder if you could get problem, some really. I think it's solved. I wonder if you get some really funky spawn locations. Like if you, for Sexton's on example, if you force spawned, you know, Alva with Nico, if you could like force a node to appear in a certain spot all the time and have some sort of benefit that way. I wonder if that would be a thing, but yeah, maybe it's something they've addressed in the patch, but there will probably, probably be some funny business on that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. They, you know, they kind of introduce a change that may seem sort of innocuous to some people like, oh, yay, multiple masters can spawn, but there can be like some really crazy implications of that kind of thing in the game. <laughs> I still rem I still remember running June on for some reason I was running it on Ancient Temple I think it, the one it is and it, if the fortress spawns it will like create a whole separate island out in the middle of nowhere like you almost can't even find it until you find this tiny little walkway that you have to walk across it and then the massive fortress is like I mean it's like way off the map <laughs> kind of weird stuff so I mean it might something like that might be what we see a little more of. Like I said, it's just a theory, but my theory is that a result of this change is that that overstacking mechanics in a map isn't going to punt stuff off anymore. Mm. That's that's my that's my theory. It's a nice thought. I don't know. Can you guys think of any like good atlas passive tree uh, setup to focus on more than one or two masters at the same time? Because like the only thing that I see this being useful for multiple masters would be maybe an ssf when i'm like not good enough to do alvas fast enough would um, wow it's still super silly but then like you could get the pact with energy and combo yeah. that yeah like early on i guess but, like what i'm trying to say is is there any benefit to having multiple masters spawn in the map outside of you know the the clear downsides that we've seen is there anything that you could do to profit from this that you can sure. use it to your advantage. Com companion Huck with an aura on him. Ainaha also helping you kill stuff and packed with energy at the same time. <laughs> right? That's a lot of power. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. I I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who, who are relishing at the idea of just putting June and Alva on the same map at the same time. You know, there's a lot of people who like doing that kind of <laughs> stuff yeah. and, and being able to just do both at once and they'll have the point allocation for it and they'll just be spamming it for june and alva and trying to profit it, off of both of those i mean also einhard's a very einhard's a really quick mechanic i think a lot of people would put like beasts on the map just because it's quick even if it's just yellow beasts just to farm yellow beasts if they're doing another mechanic like alva or june they're farming safe houses or whatever you can just kill beasts while you're on your way to the safe or onto the you know research encounter or whatever and just get yellow beasts and, and yeah. farm that way it's just something extra to put on Yeah. I had a similar thought to what you said, Balor. I also had like a 4D chess moment thinking when I saw the talisman change. So uh, we got some betrayal rewards from safe houses, from the research safe house moved into other areas. And one of them is the Veil Orb that we'll talk about in a moment. But then also uh, the craft, the Jorgen craft, Jorgen and research safe houses that allowed you to turn an amulet into a talisman is now a beast craft. So this is now likely obtained by just farming beasts, or maybe it's one of the harvest beasts. Um, there's also, I guess, a small chance that you could still, did you still get this craft from Jorgen? But it, the way that they made it sound, it's probably not like it. What I was going at, what I'm trying to say here is, this is now all unified into one 
craft. So you can't target a talisman of a specific tier anymore, like you could previously with the rank mm -hmm. of the Jorgen. So if you want to, and I know most of the talisman bases are useless, but there's still the increased attributes that some non-omniscient uh, stat stackers use. Um, that that would be incredibly hard to target now, because all the talisman bases are in the same pool. So what I was thinking is maybe this is a hint that they're reworking talisman bases because they're super outdated and most of them are not worth it. You think they might actually just be buffing them like big time? Well, or like, you know, removing some that are completely unusable and making yeah. updating the other ones to be do useful know, outcomes. Do we know who it is over there that has like just a massive hard-on for talismans? Because they've been... <laughs> completely worthless for what seven years and so they just refuse to remove them like they were awesome in ultimatum right the one yeah, league except that and one then, single yeah. league where they were when like they were... we'll make them lucky they're good now and they're good. Good. wasn't that in heist no it was ultimatum i think where they did the smart rolling right that was uh, the... i don't i don't remember when but that, that lasted one league <laughs> and then they took it away and i was like i'm, okay, I'm pretty then... sure it was in heist and then it was oh. also in ultimatum for the ones that came from ultimatum but oh, i don't know yeah yeah, imagine you, you put your amulet in Talisman, it just automatically brings every single tier of what you have to tier one. I I'd use it then. Like I just I'm just saying, like it's it's been it was time many years ago to just get rid of talismans. It's a failed experiment, it's not good, it's worthless, it doesn't add anything fun. It sounds like it's room. something it that's could be just something viable else. for for SSF, like gear progress early gear progression, I guess. Like they talk about removing bloat, but like talismans, it's like the most useless thing we've had for years. Just get rid of I them. Mean, well, th that's why I'm saying like this change would make zero sense if there's not at the same time a change to the talisman basis and their overall value in comparison to uh, other implicits and synthesis implicits, right? Because it already was a super niche use case to turn your amulet into a talisman. And now if it's a one in what, 20 chance or one in 15 or so that you hit the base that you want, then you might as well just not use a talisman for those stat stacking builds. So really like this change needs to be accompanied by other changes. Otherwise it's just never going to be used this craft. I think uh, high end players will actually look towards these talismans specifically for quant amulets because now it's tradable. You could feasibly get a bunch of these beasts collated onto one, you know, character and slam a bunch of quant amulets to try and get a quant implicit. It's definitely something that I think some people will be doing. I do that. Fair enough. <laughs> it's just one thing that I comes to my mind cool. immediately. I'll, I'll, I'll buy up like it. 40 quant amulets and just be like, all right, I'm going to oh, be so, so you can So you can slam uh, influence amulets with it? I might have missed that part. I mean, I don't think we know the answer to that. I think you should be able to. But No, if it works like previously, no. it doesn't. The answer is no. But what you can do is get the same amount of quant, a 10% quant from the implicit. From a good base. Build a really good amulet. Yeah isn't a quant amulet and then throw that 10% quant on it. I mean, yeah, that's probably because the quant affix is insanely rare to get and it'd probably be easier to roll it into a talisman than it would be to actually get the quant affix on it in the first place for the most part. Hmm. So. Yeah, but you're right. Definitely it being tradable and you're being able to like just spam 200 in a row makes it much more likely that people actually use it for that instead of, you know, right now, having to buy Jorgen after Jorgen or running your own syndicates. TFT really is the, it's the, it's the remove things that are useful or, or traded in TFT league. And that's kind of the, mm -hmm. the theme that I've kind of identified here. Right. I mean, they explicitly Definitely. said that they, they're going to design stuff out of the game that is necessary to be used in TFT. Right. And this is one of them. Yep. Yeah. And another one of them is the change to the Veiled Chaos Orb, which has oh, yeah. dropped the Chaos and is now just yeah. the Veiled Orb. And it does exactly what the Aslan, uh, Aslan, <laughs> Iceling Slam did uh, before. And uh, I've seen some confusion around here. I don't think it's reasonable to uh, assume that we still need to find out how this interacts with prefixes or suffixes cannot be changed meta mods. Some people said that that's something that we need to still find out. I would assume that this works exactly the same as it, previously. It, it'll work. It'll definitely work exactly how you expect it to. Because otherwise... I'm wondering if you guys think this is like overblown or overwrought. The people, the, the hysteria around, oh my God, it's going to be so rare. It's going to be like a new commodity. People are going to be just purchasing veiled orbs and then selling them at a massive price hike later in the league. 
so this change is not to limit our ability to craft. This change is designed to not need TFT to craft them anymore. And if that's the case, they shouldn't be that rare. They're from killing Katarina. You have to do the whole safe house and go kill Katarina to get a thing that at best is, in the best case scenario, is like a 50% chance for success, right? Historically, though, they've, they've, they've always removed some amount of accessibility to these kind of items when they make it tradable or itemized. Always. Yeah. Right? And I like if you look at the precedents, they've always made it rarer when they made it more like, easy to access. How much rarer do you think? Though? We don't, I mean, obviously, we have no idea, but I, I, wouldn't, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, that this is going to be less available than before. So, what do yes. you think? How many Katarinas for one veil drop on average? Like, because it's, if it's one in four, it's going to be fine, right? I mean, right now, it, let's just say that trading through TFT is a non issue. Very easy to do. They're comfortable doing it, right? Let's just say that. Uh, well, now it's 100%. Every single time I build a Katarina, there's, a, there's an Ashling for me to use. So, if the goal is just, oh, we're just trying to move things away from TFT, make them tradable in-game, then I I see no reason for it to be any less than like 50% drop chance. Because they're already tradable. They're already tradable. And this this wasn't to make it... Well, Harvest was already tradable, doesn't... right? Harvest was yeah. technically tradable. I could give you my item, you could service it and give it back to me. It was tradable in the way that you're saying. And then, you know, Harvest goes itemized and now look at, the, look at what it is now versus before, yeah. right? So I don't... Yeah. I just, I think... The idea in my head, at least, is that the, the purpose of these changes is very, very clearly how can we move stuff off TFT and move the requirement away from that and let people not have to do that. that it seems very obvious that that's what they're doing, right? And yet the Isling craft still exists. It's still going to yeah. be there, right? What? Well, no, this is Isling. This is the Isling craft. No, and that's the thing. Like the rewards have been removed from for Isling and Betrayal, uh, in in research safe house, and for Jorgen and for Hillock. Right. Do you know what they're replaced with exactly? Or no, that's waiting? that's no, the, what I'm aiming at. Is there's going to be new rewards for those uh, positions in? Yeah. But in the with, syndicate. With the thought in mind that the goal of these changes is just to move stuff off TFT to make it not necessarily more accessible, just accessible without having to go to a Discord server. I don't see it getting received really well if suddenly it's a 5 or 10% drop rate where I have to sp now spend four or, f four or five hours trying to farm one of them. I mean, I would not going to be... I agree with you, Balor, but historically that's just never how it's played out. I think like you can point to harvest. You can no, no, point to, I, like... I agree, <laughs> but I think the reason for those uh, changes in the past was a different reason. Okay. The the goal was different, right? I mean, that's this a specific goal of let's move things off that Discord server. And so maybe maybe I'm copium over here. Maybe I'm <laughs> copium over here. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong. And we can also talk about the side effect of you know the veiled chaos getting the boot. And like the implications of that. Yeah, that was one that, of the follow up questions. That's a way I bigger had. problem for me. That's a way bigger problem for me. What problems do you have with that? Well, I use those all of the time. Yeah. To catch I up on so Veil mods. many Veil Chaos Orbs in like basic and mid tier crafting. They're not used that often in like top end crafting. Not that often. Not compared to like just average, like lower level pieces. I use them like very very often on like low and mid tier pieces yeah. where did that go where did where did that go well, i hope that's getting replaced with something i hope i'm still getting the ability to do that that what the veiled council currently does right now no nah, i think they specifically want uh, the veiled mods that drop on the ground to matter more like that people aren't just filtering everything out that drops on the ground from betrayal except for npc specific mods but that people are looking at the mods a lot more at least early on in the league trying to itemize and yeah trying to gear their character for for maps but yeah like definitely stuff like you know i have triple resist boots and i just lock the suffixes and throw a veiled orb on for a chance to get one of the movement speed unveils on them that's not mm -hmm. possible anymore which was a cheap mid-tier craft 
I don't know why they, I mean, there's just probably stuff we don't know in the patch. And I, it always feels weird sometimes, like when they come out with these teasers, there's always like a piece of the puzzle we're missing. And at, at first glance, it may look yeah. like a huge nerf or whatever, but then the patch notes comes out and it's like, ah, okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah. like, and we definitely get that a lot. So I, would, I wouldn't freak out quite yet. I would maybe wait till patch notes come out. That does really. happen quite a lot. The other implication, now of course we don't know what replaces these rewards that have been removed from the safe house leaders or from the from the ranked members of the syndicate in the different departments. Um, but, well, doesn't this kind of incentivize playing the syndicate the wrong way? Like, as in you're going for more Katarinas per hour instead of like trying to put well, the right people the into the right way? positions? Well, I'm, I'm just saying, like, they, they're really proud of their minigame, right? They always wanted... We've we've seen historically that, for example, they uh, they insisted on resetting the entire board with Katarina because they had a certain way in mind how they wanted to be played, and now this obviously rewards people who spam Katarina much more. Yeah. Well, without the context of things, we don't know the context. Maybe the new rewards are so super desirable that you're gonna. But the rewards we know right now, with Aisling being removed, like what are the current lucrative rewards for somebody? They're even well, like what? What are the attractive rewards for somebody farming betrayal right now? Besides killing, I don't know about Katarina. profit wise, but the other thing I use very often is the thirty percent quality things, which yeah. are also gone. So what is what are you doing betrayal now? I mean, they're going to add new rewards, of course, but like what? A lot of the rewards are actually so outdated and like obsolete. It feels like yeah, the Richie White sockets. <laughs> yeah. Might be something crazy. It blows her socks off. <laughs> Could be. Scarab rewards, kind of not amazing. Yeah, like, I, don't, I don't know. The Scarab well, rewards scarabs... aren't really bad. I always liked them. I just felt like in the current state of the game where you get so many oh, Scarabs yeah, from other sources, they were underwhelming in terms of like the raw quantity, but I always thought it was great in Syndicate Having... that you could target specific uh, Scarabs. Having Scarabs is great until you do all that work and get four of them. You're like, oh, this mob on my map dropped 20. Oh, this league, One 200. rare mob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a regular league, you know, we, we don't see the massive winged explosions, obviously. But, uh, yeah, ob yeah, it's clearly, it took a back seat. June took a back seat on the Scarab Rewards this league. Uh, and Calandra League as well. But this upcoming league. Do you guys think uh, it'll be an in-map league or bossing league or no league shot league it's an in-map mechanic after affliction that's just i want it to be in map so bad they're the best oh, leagues no. I, I mean there was an interview right where they're talking about how kind of like they developed the leagues and basically from what they said they were like okay you know this map or this time around it's going to be an in-map mechanic and the next time it's going to be a you know its own thing and they kind of try to spread it out i don't think they try to do like the same kind or type of mechanic two times in a row so I would be really, really surprised if this is an in-map mechanic after Affliction, right? I, I, I wouldn't mind if what it had an in-map component. I, I still want more in-map things. It feels like it's been years since I've, other than this league. Yeah, this I have a, I don't years think... since a good in-map league mechanic that I really, really enjoyed. Sentinel. I really am of the opinion that they, even if the mechanic isn't in map, there should be some sort of mini encounter inside of the map that gives you access to it. Like they used to do this for a lot of mechanics, and I feel like they've been kind of mm. shying away from it. Like if you think, think if you think of like Sanctum, right, you just kind of get vacuumed in, and then you click a button and you bank your room. I feel like that's super uninteresting. I feel like it would be much better if there was just a little pack of mobs you kill, you blow it up, whatever, and then you earn your Sanctum room. Like that would feel better to me. That's why I thought from the start that Crucible was going to be a great league, but then it missed a little bit the mark on the balance yeah. of where the reward came from because you didn't get anything from killing the monsters. I don't, I don't know what their obsession is with removing loot from these mobs. Like Ultimatum, <laughs> Expedition, Ritual, Crucible, they just don't drop anything, and I don't, I don't know They're beyond. Why. To a certain extent, I, right? No, Beyond's fine, right? Like, I, it's it's good still, but like, I have more of a problem with stuff like Expedition. Literally, they, if you kill the whole yeah. Expedition pack and you don't have a Quant Remnant on it, and you hold Alt, and like two Wisdom Scrolls drop, and it's just like Ultimatum is the one I have the biggest problem with because it's my favorite mechanic to play. Like my favorite in map mechanic, just like play wise. Ultimatum really loved it. Really loved it when it was there. 
really enjoyed playing it this league, but it drops nothing. It drops nothing. It's not worth it. It takes the amount of time it took me to run the whole map and I get like two, two chaos things from an entire 10 run. Like it just isn't. Why did the mobs not drop loot? I mean, yeah, it's even harder to justify in the context of Affliction. Like, was this really that problematic that we had to remove all the mobs from Ultimatum? I don't know. <laughs> right. It's just really strange to me. I just, yeah, I can't fair. think of a, a I'm, I struggle to think of a justification it's for an justification. A ARPG, a hack and slash ARPG, where my entire goal is kill monsters, drop loot, to say these monsters don't drop loot. That's I have to insane. assume that, uh, that they were getting the league mechanic balanced around and that they were just having issues, just repeated issues of trying to balance the loot from Ultimatum and, and there was an executive decision. To say, Fine, pull all the loot from Ultimatum. We can't, we're not figuring this out in time. Pull okay. it. No loot. That's so the way that... Happened. Similar, yeah, but like the way that I imagine it happens is that they balance the league, right? And there is a point where the monsters did give loot for the time that you play and, and kill them, right? But specifically, take the example of Crucible, right? There was probably a point where they were like, well, this weapon thing is kind of fun, but it takes too long and it doesn't really feel like you get payoff. What if we make it such that you get experience on the, uh, you progress the trees on the weapons faster in turn for like giving less loot from the monsters? And then eventually they shifted it all into that progression because they thought that that was more rewarding. And now we don't see like the trade off, we only see that the monsters don't drop loot. But we, we don't see what we would have had otherwise, right? I mean, that's definitely fair, but it's just like from the player perspective, I if the mobs like don't drop loot, there's like a 99% chance I just don't even want to engage with it to begin with. Like, mm -hmm. like the, the, the whole deferred reward thing, like I understand it, but I feel like in a lot of these mechanics, it's like super overused. Um, and just like if you want to do like a mapping play style, if your mechanic doesn't drop loot, then it's just like off the it's off the list immediately just how it is oh that's yeah. uh that brings up another point i kind of wanted to bring we don't have to switch over to last epoch but there's something about last epoch that i really like and that is their built-in system to increase loot rewards scales everything including like you know specific rewards from sort of specific things circle of fortune seems to compound loot that is dropped from other things you know you get higher corruption you get more loot across yeah. the board even boss specific drops drop more often even boss loot, even the rewards at the it's end amazing of the map, everything I, I wish poe did did more of that like i i wish you know if you run it you know for example an eight bot corrupted map and farm legions you actually got more you know a, a lot more loot for like more league specific loot but uh, i guess you do a little bit but it just doesn't seem to impact it all that much not like it does in last epoch anyway it's a uh, like murky territory because there's like you run into the problem where like if stuff like that isn't a fixed reward like as soon as map quant or mf from your character starts to affect it it's like a really really bad thing i think ggg has actually done a really good job in this regard where you need to have a mix of loot tiles right stuff that has flat rewards and also at the same time stuff that can have that hyperscaling effect with map iiq uh, you know, player quant, all of this kind of thing. And I think it's healthy to have a, a mix of both. And if it's used oh. one way or towards the other, it can be kind of negative, I think. I agree with I'm the gonna... outcome, like wanting to balance the outcome, but the method, it creates such a overwrought layer, multi-layered of complexity that, again, you got to get the handbook out for POE mm -hmm. to figure out how stuff drops. Oh, and this I think stuff. Thing people yeah. appreciate with last week, Mark, if you don't need a handbook to figure out how to drop more loot. You know? I'm going to blow people's minds and maybe upset Snap and Snoo. Um, uh -oh. I have changed my mind because of Last Epoch on something I have held dear as an opinion for the last nine years. I am now of the opinion that I Did want you like to pick up rarity loot? items on gear gone. I no okay. longer want quantum rarity to exist. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, we should talk about this. To go quant farming mm -hmm. in Last Epoch isn't really quant farming. It's just making my content harder and harder and making my character better and better. And then I get better and better rewards. And for the last nine years, I've been somebody who's like, no, no, no I get it. I want quant and rarity because it makes 
by character weaker by putting this on and that is the same as making more difficult content and i have argued i've argued for quantum rarity on items for years wait but can and now you that quickly I've... outline why don't you feel the same anymore why, like why don't you feel like it's the same anymore it well it's it is the same i've just changed my opinion because i now want I now want, because of Last Epoch, I feel better investing into my, like investing into the content being harder to be the way to get better rewards rather than making my character weaker. It just feels way better and it's way more open. It's not limiting me on gear. It's not limiting me on builds. Any build can go into like there's no like oh you want to do a thousand plus corruption to get the most amount of rewards well you must play one of these three builds that are the only ones that can wear the right gear to give you a reward that doesn't exist anymore right like that that doesn't and i just it seemed a lot more fun to me and i don't i'm still like struggling with this idea in my head as well myself because for like 10 years i've been a big quant rarity don't take it away from me person and now i, I feel that shift happening the question I would posit to you is, do you think that that is, you have this feeling because there is an infinitely scaling system in front of you. I think if so. Last Epoch, if Last Epoch capped out at 300 corruption or whatever, 500 corruption for your build, do you think you'd, you'd feel the same way? No, that would be a problem because then so, I could hit 300 really easily. So if, if at the same time, would you try and advocate for a similar system to be implemented in PoE? Would you I want think... an infinitely scaling mapping system? Because there's other problems that get introduced, right? When you introduce yeah, this kind of thing. Are, so that, that, are... that, that feeling Definitely. might only be because there is an infinitely scaling thing that is in front of you that you feel invested into, you know, making your character as powerful as possible. But with the absence of that, it might not feel the same, I guess. I think it's hard. It's hard to know. I, I think, yes, the fact that there is an infinite scaling thing is definitely the reason where I'm like, well, I don't need quant gear. I don't feel the need to build quant gear because I can just build better gear and do better, higher content. But... Yeah, it's almost like you, you got to take the whole package. I yeah, do. I, I do. I, snap on here. I do kind uh, of wish that there were I ways both to scale more in PoE. I don't know if infinite's the answer because if infinite's me, the answer, then... To me, the issue... My my takeaway from last epoch, I I, I can absolutely understand where ba uh, sorry Baylor Mage is coming from. I can absolutely understand where he's coming from, uh, but I'm of the opinion that the major issue with Poe's implementation of uh, Magfine Loot is the fact that it's tunneled onto specific uniques that don't give you any sort of power, and you obviously have no legendaries to combine powers, and it, it just pigeonholes you into getting taking you know otherwise garbage gear. Uh, that does absolutely feel bad in respect to trying to build up a player power. Uh, if, for example, PoE, if the only way to get quantity gear in Path of Exile was through a suffix roll uh, that was like 1%, you know, the bottom tier only went up to like 5% or something, that would be much more interesting uh, to me so to gearing decisions. What was the rationalization of GGG removing quant on rares in the first place? Because Oh, because I... it was mandatory. Every single piece must have it or it doesn't exist. Could have just smashed the roll ranges down really hard to make it a more interesting decision, I guess. More of a trade-off, yeah. Was that really why? But, I mean, we still have the same effect right now. It's just coupled onto garbage uniques. Like, yeah, I didn't play I was... at the time... Were the numbers higher on the rares? Was, was Way it like higher. 10, 20 it was like 20, it was like 20 quant on a boost. Well, that's the reason why. I mean, if it was only like 5% at the top end or something, that would be a much better system than the you know 20% on your unique boots that have almost no run speed or anything else on them, right? Yeah, I mean, I the itemization is like a, a whole other topic, and I think definitely contributes to the negative sentiments of quantity mm -hmm. on you know in PoE is that Currently, the only way to get quantity is to slap on a bunch of trash, like all, and it's just all garbage, like all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is is really uninteresting and a big contributing factor to the reason Absolutely. why people just really hate quantity and PoE. I think they could take steps to make it, you know, way more engaging in terms of itemization than it currently is. 
I mean, like I can even just throw out a few like random ideas. Like you could, you could have, for example, like, I don't know, quantity on a suffix, but also it has like a negative affix similar to scourge. Like, in, in the, like negative affixes you're trying to overcome. Like even just some rudimentary system like that, that they could expand and design upon would definitely like do a lot to help that itemization feel a lot better. But yeah. Like just experimental affixes. Something. <laughs> Yeah. Just just to be clear, the way POE is right now, I would not advocate for just hard removing the quantum gear and whatnot, right? Like, that's not... That can't just be done in a vacuum. It wouldn't make sense. I just... I'm still a believer in Magic Fine Gear as a concept. I still enjoy the added layer of decision-making in gearing process, um, whether it is an infinite scaling game like Last Epoch or POE with, uh, you know, different layers and caps to it. Uh, either way, I would still advocate for it, but absolutely would have to require delicate balancing. And uh, like I like I mentioned, uh, to me, a delicate balance point might be something like a suffix piece, tier one, you get plus one quant. Tier two, it's still plus one quant. Tier three, plus three, or two, then three. And then like tier six, seven drop only would maybe go up to four or five quant on one single piece. And that would be a pretty big sacrifice. Uh, to do that but even that might be too much for example so i definitely think uh, so like they would need to be careful with the balancing on that and the current iteration in, in path of exile is pretty awful i gotta say okay so here's the question um probably specifically the snap you and mp and your team and whatnot yep you, you do a bunch of group magic find colors all sorts of stuff every league it's very fun it looks really fun i'm jealous every time um <laughs> The best version if, you of had an, if you had an equally rewarding option that just made content so fucking difficult that you all had to put on real gear, you had to build, redesign a party about being the most powerful possible damage and defense wise, didn't have any quant at all, but when you run those maps, you were getting the same amount of rewards. Would that feel more it, fun? Well, I think I'm I mean, just so, imagining the game crashing when you say no, that. No, like I. I think, yes. I mean, we did this kind of thing in Dell because there was that infinitely scaling thing, right? But mm -hmm. the problem is, is if that content were to exist, the if it was gated towards having a fully min-maxed group that could go and access and complete it, that in itself is hugely problematic, right? If the content is so hard that a, a min-max six-man party with all of the multipliers, curse spot, everything, like the defenses from a Mana Guardian... That's the only kind of characters that are able to complete it. That in itself is super problematic. So I don't know how you can make content that is so hard that that you know it's not gated to having like min maxed or bot setups and stuff like that, right? I just don't know if that vision or idea that you have is even possible in the current state of Poe. It, yeah, yeah. No, there, there's we saw it in affliction. In affliction, right? We, how many how many people were doing aura bot duos in affliction? The, the number is tripled. If you look at aura bots in Tota. There's like three or four thousand characters that played aura bots in in Total League. You look at the next league in Affliction, where the difficulty skyrocketed. You see four or five times as many people playing mm -hmm. aura bots, and it's simply just because the game got more difficult. And even if it is possible to do what I was just describing, it it does. You're right. It comes with a whole bunch of other new problems that are different. But everything has positives and negatives, and. Here's the the real question is, is it okay to make content so hard most people can't do it? And my answer is yes. I mean... I think it's perfectly fine to move, to be able to make content so hard most people can't do it. it it's, yes, but should there be more rewards in it? Should the rewards also be like infinitely scaled up or should there be a point at which going harder doesn't give you more rewards but just more EP and bragging rights, leaderboard sort of stuff, but not have any well, economic it, implications it shouldn't be scaled the same way affliction league is scaled its rewards that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's funny to me balor that like you know if i just in my mind i imagine that situation right because right now mm -hmm. in poe uh you know group play like it is good but it's not as op as people have this like conceptually oh, no. in their brain like and for some reason like you, you look at group play and there's just all these items dropping and in your mind like oh my god these guys are these guys are rich they're just they're dropping so much stuff it's crazy but then you actually like every single day you, you, yeah, like you, dr you. <laughs> you drill down and it's like these we're making like 10 maybe five to ten div an hour which is like on par with like really lazy solo strategies that you can put together 
And uh, I can only imagine the amount of complaining that that would happen or ensue if only groups were being like able to complete this like high tier content. That would just be crazy. Because like <laughs> I, I think there's there's kind of a cool system or uh, the the ecosystem of this whole thing is kind of cool. And in the beginning, like on day one or day two, groups have an enormous advantage. You're able to take in immense advantage of the marketplace dropping tons of you know mid-tier uniques that are have incredible value like on day one day two and the game is actually relatively speaking on day one compared to all the different content that is at our disposal for the average solo player if you were to try to do content that a five mirror budget build does on day one that would constitute extraordinarily difficult content uh, and group players can do it much easier. So in that sort of microcosm okay. of day one or day two, that's, that's, you do have that so, advantage. But the advantage that's, that's, disappears very quickly over the course of the first week. And I, I guess everybody kind of gets to have their cake. You know? This thing you just described, though, isn't true. Aurobots don't come yeah. online on day one. They are absolute dead weight they, on they day one it. and and even okay, through like even through day two. You're literally dragging these Orobots through the campaign because yeah. they—they're one, they're a scion, they're worthless, and then two, okay, the gear I, I doesn't. I, yeah, I yeah, got, no, I got no. the timing window wrong, but I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. at a certain extent the timing window exists where the groups are brought online for the ultra ultimate. You know what what used to be like triple beyond farming, but now it's just you know beyond and all that stuff. Uh, there certainly is a timing window where the groups have the huge advantage of being able to do the hardest content efficiently where solo players just... Yeah, you'd be correct in an old meta where five orbs were relevant. However, these days, the meta being eight modded, whatever, non-delirium maps, because you don't even need delirium because the meta's farming boxes, you do not need a very strong character to pull this off. You really don't. <laughs> um, and so that barrier like to entry is a lot lower than it used to be, which makes that power that you're describing, being able to break into that content a little bit easier, a little less relevant for groups. Just because the content is I'm, so easy right now. It's just eight mod farming boxes. Right, yeah. You don't need so anything I've, for that. I've been saying this for years, and it occurs to me that I have never actually asked you or MP or anybody else if it's true or if you think it's true. But when trying to explain group content, because I've done a lot of group content, obviously not nearly as much as you guys, but I've done group stuff before. And my opinion has always been, and what I've tried to explain to people, is that if MP and Snap and their whole team or any other team, because there are a lot of other teams, you guys are just the public-facing one, right, that everybody knows. If all the players in that team played with the same amount of hours, the same amount of enthusiasm solo for the whole time, with designed builds and strategies for solo play, as a group you would all be far 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 richer by the time you normally split if you I were mean, individually with the same amount of like veracity and excitement and time undoubtedly i mean low, you would all be way richer i mean undoubtedly it's just group play you there is some advantage what snooba is saying where you can break into the market earlier but it does not compensate for the amount of like just raw divine per hour that you output as a solo player compared to dividing that number by six in a group um, it has never been better for for groups compared to the competent or or comparatively equal solo player farming the same amount of hours. It just has never been the case that group is better. I absolutely but, believe you on that, on that note. I mean, I, I mean, I believe you so much. I've never even attempted to make do group play, <laughs> and I just to do like to the, that's what I've always I used to do group play in Diablo games. So it's not that I have anything against group play. I just I believe it on its face that uh, that the degree of hassle, especially the organization and you know the the amount of trust and loyalty and expectations that go in with you know building a group i'm sure it's quite fulfilling you know from a social standpoint i'm sure you have a lot of fun doing it but uh, yeah I, I bet it's a little bit demoralizing uh, on the back end realizing when you count all the chips that it's, it's uh, not it's think, not about hmm, that like we're, we're here to have fun right that's like the main thing but yeah, it's just really yeah. funny the perception right that people have about group play like we're doing it because we're getting rich and it's just like, uh, like, like it's actually I, I love this is the biggest point of drama you have uh you know yeah. on your streams and and everything it's about this right here i mean it's it's just funny the perception it just is fascinating. To me, like i've been saying that and i've never actually asked you guys but i've been telling people like they lose money by playing in a group like, not really, because if they weren't in a group, they wouldn't be doing the fun thing that they want to be doing. So none of them would play as much or as 
vigorously as they do in the first week or two because it's the most amount of fun they have. But they're doing it because it's fun, not because it's profitable. It's never been the case that group play is the best thing to do to make money. <laughs> it just, I, I think we kind of uh, underscore that you know when you guys are playing group. How, for example, how many hours a day are you playing in the first day, first two days, three days? Um, typically, we do oh. like an eight. We do like an eighteen to twenty hour session on the first day. We're not doing okay. like crazy thirty hour like shenanigans. We're not. We're not into that. We do like a solid like eighteen hours, like twenty hours, and we well, sleep. It's like a lot. I, of I course, think but... that most people listening to this are going to say eighteen to twenty hours. That is crazy shenanigans. Uh, I mean, there's there's people head. that are doing two days, yeah. three days straight. Like that's really like super unhealthy. I think. Like I mean, yeah, even doing like eighteen hours is unhealthy. But like you know, I'm getting I'm getting my solid six seven hours of sleep and coming back the next day. I'm not comp I'm not compromising my sleep or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. So it, so it is important to keep in mind, and this goes in favor of your argument, that usually when people are comparing like group players, they're not taking into account that you guys are playing 18 hours in a day and that they're kind of imagining or comparing a solo player that is also in their mind kind of no lifing it, but maybe it's just 12 hours a day, which, hello, that's two thirds of the amount of time that uh, you're putting in mind. So it's important to keep that perspective that it's if a solo player also playing 18 or 20 hours a day, uh, they're yeah they're they're basically gonna keep up with you in terms of you know it's how, also how good enough to not six people right like there's six people in your map but that's not a whole team I like that's not do, do, every if more people are getting a cut and more people are doing work than six we have a nine man team that plays we have three traders that play with us and six people are, that are in the map so like it's a much bigger operation than what you might see on its face <laughs> yeah uh, well okay I'm, I'm a little curious too uh for, for you snap i have a question um about league specific rewards or i think you've called it deferred rewards things like harbinger for example uh, you, you lose out on the ability of, of farming choices right because you have to split the loot six different ways. How how is it affecting uh, certain types of loot? Uh, there's certain strategies you can't go for, right? That a solo player yeah. can go for, like even just like Legion, Alc and Ghost spam. A solo yeah, player can so, make a bank on that, but a group group can't, right? So to, to be specific, deferred rewards is when you have something like Expedition, where you get like a little currency, and later you can come back and obtain a reward through the vendor. That's oh, deferred okay, rewards, okay, that's and mean. then. We call, I mean, I think GG also calls this loot tiles, right? Where there's a fixed mm -hmm. uh, reward from the mob or whatever that you kill or the chest that you open that doesn't change no matter what. Um, like blocks quantity, or... yeah. The quantity yeah. on the map doesn't affect it. The Harbinger, quantity on your gear shard. doesn't affect it. Yes. And we call those loot tiles. And in those cases in groups, uh, loot tiles are basically uh, a non-starter for groups, right? Because if you're paying the prices that a solo player would obtain to put like that scarab on the map, right? Um, you're then going to go into the map, obtain that reward, and then divide that by six immediately. So basically anything that doesn't scale with the group quantity uh, is just basically a no-go immediately, um, which so limits I thought you. you might be unhappy about that. I mean, I think, I think there needs to be both things in the game. I think there needs to be loot tiles that solo players can engage with that isn't accessible to group players. Um, and at the same time, I think there needs to be some other portion or corner of the game where players like me who like to play in a group can also engage with certain systems and have fun with it. I think that both existing is healthy. Um, so, I mean, while it is tragic that I can't engage with, you know, like 90% of the mechanics in the game, like I understand why this is the case. Because, um, you know, if all of the stuff was scaling with quantity and rarity and I could do party multipliers on all of it, like that wouldn't be a very good situation either. It'd be probably worse than what it is right now. <laughs> But uh, yeah, um, it's because the, the primary uh, portion of the player base doesn't play in a group, right? Th there's some small section of it, maybe, I don't know, like 5 10% of people play in like duo, party, whatever. I don't, I don't know what the real number is. but It's probably way less than that, I would guess. I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I just look at uh, indexed aura bots on PoE Ninja. That's like the only metric I can kind of like pull up. Like, there's this many people playing aura bots. And in Tota, it was over 10,000, so... 10,000 ore bots made in, in, or in a Affliction League, sorry. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, like having those things not accessible by group, I think is definitely a good thing because there just there needs to be a diversity of, of rewards, I think, that, that makes the game healthy, for sure. Very cool uh, perspective. I was really curious about your take on that. I mean, it would bother me, I mean, at least on its face, but I guess, you know, You've done it for so long. You have a pretty well-rounded 
uh, opinion about it. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think the thing is like you can engage with certain things that have the loot tiles, but it's like really limited and you bet definitely don't want it taking a slot of your scarab and you definitely don't want it taking a slot of a sextant. That's like the main things. <laughs> Those are the most powerful multipliers you have available to you in, in party, right? Next topic. He's muted. He's muted? Oh, oh he's muted. Catmas is muted. He's talking. Oh, no. no one can hear. Wow. Nah, it was just five words, and I remember them, so not, nothing of value was lost. Uh, I was asking, did we go over all the teasers? And then I stated that probably there's only the raw quality of life left, right? The items showing on the Horde crafting station while hovering the craft button, the control <laughs> left click, uh, all stuff into the trade window where you can yeah, do think... multiple stacks at once question is there any quality of life you think we're missing anybody have anything to bring up what is the big quality of life thing you think that could be implemented i'm gonna have to replace some of my income i can tell you that much i can't overstate um how much i probably make like 10 to 15 percent of my income selling gloves right now to poe players that's how bad it's just as much is clicking. on your fingers. I sell compression gloves, and it makes up probably 10% of my content creator income. And these quality of life changes are, kind of, are fixing so many of the things that hurt fingers. They're costing me money. I'm, I'm still happy about it. Please change it all. Please make it all better. But, I think I always think about this argument is like high APM players are going to play with high APM. Like if there's less clicking on this to do, then they'll move on to something else faster and do more clicking there. I mean, you're still going to sell gloves better. I'm confident. I mean, I think the biggest clicks right now is just looting, right? That surely like in the game is yeah. looting stuff in the map and then transferring that from your stash to the, or from your inventory to the stash is like the most clicks by far that any PoE player does. I wonder yeah. if the uh, did they clarify if the like control clicking that they showed in the in like the trade window is going to work for your stash as well? Because I know some people asked. I think in the comments on Twitter they said yes, it would work, but uh, it's that would be specifically the here on the post it says only straight into a trade window. I mean, if you could if you could transfer all types of one thing into your stash with one click, that would be a really crazy change. That'd be great. Well, all the, like stackable items, right? Like, I don't think that would greatly apply to anything else. There's a, uh, I can't remember what game does this, but uh, I think in crafting, a quality of life I would like to see is uh, one whereby you, you specify the exact role you want to hit. And if you were to chaos spam it or essence spam it or whatever, you only need to click it one time and it will just keep just draining your entire stockpile of consumables until it hits that roll in one click instead of you having to sit there and look at it and have to type it out over and over and over in the search mm -hmm. window to wait for it to highlight or whatever highlighting is nice quality of life but i would much rather you know so just press it once and then you two just two things drain it down mm -hmm. until you hit one unfortunately there are already quite a few people doing that with third party programs those are illegal yeah. and they do get banned but people are already doing that yeah. And more people are doing it than get banned. So it's already a thing. So that's a pretty good argument to just let the rest of us who don't want to cheat also do it. Because that's one of the best ways to combat something like that. Unless you want to spend hundreds and hundreds of hours continuously, constantly for the rest of time trying to fight and find the people using cheats. Uh, just let everybody else do it because it's not that impactful anyway. And now we're all in the same playing field. So that... And two, I don't know who tried it, but Undecember, ARPG, pretty under the radar, I guess, because it had a lot of pay-to-win stuff in it. But as far as I'm concerned, they basically just ripped PoE's crafting system and then added every single piece of quality of life that I have ever wanted to it and put it in their game. <laughs> and it had exactly what you're describing. You would get a list of mods that could roll on that item and you would say... I want one of these mobs. Stop when you get that. And then you would hit the go button and it would just it would just roll like six, mm, seven times a second and just game, keep yeah. using your stuff until it got one of the things that you asked for. 
And then it would just go mm, and it would stop and you would look at it and be like, mm, don't want that. Go again. Not good enough. Go again. Not good enough. Oh, this one's good enough. And it would use it. It was the same idea. It was they renamed stuff, but it was just straight up like alterations, transmutes, regals. Like it was they just ripped Peewee's crafting system and then added every quality of life you ever wanted to it. And it yeah. was so good. <laughs> the proliferation of those cheats is actually kind of wild to me. The things that will like auto roll stuff for you. It feels like it's an eventuality that they're going to eventually implement something similar to what you're saying where it'll stop on a certain mod because there's just more and more people are like literally just doing auto rolling macros or it's just crazy to me that this is so widespread in the game right now. Yeah, I feel like all the incentive structures should lead us to that point anyway because they want us spending more time playing the game. They want every decision of quality life should be for the endeavor of spending more time killing monsters, getting loot. In the game i mean that's the whole point of the game i feel i mean there might be a few exceptions here you could, i guess you could make an argument that crafting should be its own sort of meta experience and maybe you should feel super invested in the process of i mean whatever. as per but, design goal also inventory management they want items to feel like they have weight like yeah. that you have to physically deal with them so yeah definitely mm -hmm. like to some like, degree also the just yeah, and, things and into I, your can, stash I can respect is part of the, the argument that, you know feel the weight of every click to see what you rolled on the item but to me it's still you know you're spending a lot of time in the hideout not you know killing monsters and, that, and players in general would like to do that that mattered and was good when after four days of playing i had 250 alterations total right yeah. that felt great now even before this league, I can pull 250 alterations out of a map. One mob. Yeah, <laughs> that, before this league. <laughs> so it's not yeah, it's not yeah. the same numbers. Like back when they made those decisions, we were rolling 100 alts a day. Well, and it's now about we to be can those numbers again. thousand alts in like three hours and then go make another one, right? Yeah, that and thing. also the mod pools have inflated. There's like so many yeah. mods that you can roll. So it's like way harder. And on average, you're spending way more alterations on a blue craft. Than you did They're just going to take us back to the Stone ago. Age and Poe too, so I guess uh, solve it. I hope so. That way, anyway. I enjoyed the like, Stone Age a lot. <laughs> I I understand how they built it to begin with, and I think it worked really well back in the day. The thing is now, now in my mind, you're faced with an option because these cheats exist. People are alt rolling their stuff. A lot of, a lot of, uh, probably not like a lot of people are making it sound like every second person is doing it. They're not. But the people who are doing it are crafting 25 items in an hour that would take you an hour to make one because you've got to do it manually looking with your eyes. And so... Plus one bows. Yeah. Yeah. Just... Like, there's just... Those things are happening. So you're set with two options. Either we spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to figure out how to stop that from happening so that people can't cheat. And then you're constantly fighting them. Eventually, you find out how to how to do it. You do a giant band wave. It's great. Everyone's gone. A month later, they've fixed the problem. And now you're starting from scratch trying to hunt them down again. And it's just a continuous cycle of waste of everybody's time. Or you, which is my opinion on how you should do stuff, is when you look at those sort of cheats that people are running and you go, well, a ton of people are running this to automate alt spamming. Why? Well, it's because alt spamming is like way too many clicks. There's way too many mods. If you want to do it at such a speed, you roll over things. It's just a, a pain in the ass. Or maybe instead of spending a bunch of dev time stopping people from doing that, you find the problem and the reason people want to do that and then fix it. That's I mean, how I do Gigi's been really good about designing that kind of thing out of the game. I just don't know that it's become that big of a problem, that it's become a priority for them. But I feel like eventually it will. It, um, it's, it's probably not. But it's getting worse. Yeah, I think eventually it's just an eventuality in my mind. So it's just as soon as it becomes a problem in the community, people start complaining about it, like they did with TFT. It'll get it'll get fixed. Yeah. Do Do you guys feel like the the game, the quality of the game, has diminished since they've been working on Poe two? And if so, nah. do you think that would accelerate once Poe two comes out? I mean, I'm kind of curious as to the state of Poe one. Is it gonna you know, is it going to maintain its level? Is it going to go downhill? Is it going to go uphill with PoE2 uh, once? 
they're I, might, I, mean, invested into I have a controversial opinion about this, but I felt like there was definitely like a lull where it was quite obvious that there was less developers working on PoE 1. And that was right around like the Crucible era. Like the fact that Crucible is releasing the state that it was was just like astounding to me. And it is not on par with the leagues that GGG has released uh, prior. And it feels like with Affliction specifically, that that quality has like been bumped up a huge notch. And, 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 you know, a little bit, I felt that with Tota as well. And it kind of feels like they are ramping up like a lot more developers and designers on stuff on PoE 1. I definitely can really feel like that they're, that the effort is like way up there. It's like, oh man, I just, you can just look at Crucible. It's just like crazy. Yeah. They might have like, literally, literally hired a bunch of people in that timing just, window. And, and yeah, just Crucible got the brunt end of the bad timing. <laughs> but yeah, that's just, uh, there's definitely uh I, I hope that we'll continue to see leagues on par with the quality of, of of like affliction i think like affliction has its own problems of course but like just the level of quality of like the the amount of rewards you're getting like it's all fleshed out the like the new zones like all the art like it's all super like well done and i hope to see more of that and less of crucible as i can stop <laughs> talking trash oh, about so crucible over and over <laughs> people like overlook it because as a of concept. the power I mean, I think I have a bigger problem with Crucible than Calandra. Like, I actually really? think Crucible. I mean, Calandra had the whole like reward thing, like, and that was not great the way it was all communicated. Like, I all have that. no problem with Calandra. like, I, I, but I mean, I have problems with that in regards to Calandra. But in terms of like the league itself, I have way more problems with the state of Crucible than I do with Calandra. Oh, that's sure. crazy! I quit Calandra League in the first week and didn't come back. But why is that? Oh. Uh... It was the worst league that's ever existed. It's just the I rewards, think. but that's like a completely different thing. Like if they didn't, they, if they had communicated that we're doing this like big nerf, like it'd be a completely different story, which they didn't. Nah, it was the gameplay I, and the reward structure and the complete waste of what is, in my opinion, the most important character that's ever existed in PoE. I think Crucible's <laughs> worse. I think everything, <laughs> like having to stand there, like, and you click the button and then it takes forever the like get the mechanic and if you didn't you want to inter no interact rewards. yeah and you get nothing and then in calandra you could at least you know click a tile it takes you half a second to click click some random stuff and you can move on with your day and trade it to somebody else right like that was a thing you could do but in crucible it was just i, I, I just think the prospect of getting like a great weapon with a proper tree for your build was way more of a carrot on a stick uh, or, or like at the end of the tunnel than, uh, than the Calandra mirror jewelry was or maybe double I'm, jewelry. Maybe I'm talking about like the moment to moment gameplay of the mechanic itself because maybe that's what I care about a little bit more. I think like Crucible itself, like the actual moment to moment gameplay and combat of Crucible was just horrible. The fact that you have to stand there for so long and you have to like build <laughs> yeah, up wasn't the that bar. just because the monsters didn't drop loot wouldn't have the, that all have been alleviated if the monsters actually directly drop loot that scaled with player quantity well, i mean there's that as well but that's like adding on top of the fact that i have to sit there and stand still it's uh, and I, I mean i have a problem with with this concept with stuff like betrayal where i have to like interact with an npc while like stuff's blowing up around me like the nothing yep. safe uh, but yeah, I think Crucible yeah, is the worst example of that. Yeah, that was bad because if you interrupted the channel and because some, something targeted you, then you also yeah. like stop then, channeling prematurely. Then and you, you don't get a bad mechanic. And it's just everything. Yeah, it's just I, I am happy that there's a lot more development time being put into each PoE 1 league. I'm super happy about that. And I am thrilled to see the the new uh, reveal of Necropolis and what they have in store. Uh, I also the end of that i agree with all of that but i also do not expect the quality of poe one leagues to go down at least not for the first year or two i don't know about long term but certainly when poe two comes out i don't expect them to leave poe one behind at least not immediately or anytime real soon I, that <laughs> might change if in a few years time people are playing poe one for like a week at a time and then just leaving and if all of the focus from the community ends up just like, oh, PoE 2 is way better, I'm just going to be over there playing that, then I'm sure it'll change, right? But I don't see that as a problem coming soon. I agree, yeah. 
I honestly think PUE2 coming out will just uh, allow PUE1 to be more PUE1 and hopefully let them bury all their ruthless yeah. ambitions for PUE1 and, and give people for P that want to play PUE1 more PUE1 and put all the, the PUE2E stuff, the ruthless with gold sort of stuff into PUE2 and then I'll be happy with that and I'll play that and every once in a while take a vacation in PUE1 but like yeah, everyone was... who doesn't enjoy that sort of stuff still has a game to play. I think that's the entire idea behind splitting it, right? Or here, here's a fun question for you guys what like where do you think you, you're probably going to sit in terms of playing poe 2 versus poe 1 I, i'm sure we'll all give the same example or same answer that we hope you can play poe 2 and that they will cycle on and off of each other but do you think there's a chance you will play exclusively poe 2 or exclusively poe 1 or especially if you had to choose which one do you think you would choose just based on everything you know right now I anyway everyone's going to pick primarily not exclusively I don't see a world where any of us don't spend at least one or two weeks in the opposite one when it, like every launch, right? Like it, it's just like I'm going to spend one or two weeks in most ARPG launches, unless it's Diablo, then it's one or two hours, maybe days. Um, I get to like, a point where you have too many options, actually. Like, I'm still going to go both, right? Is LE and PoE2 and PoE cycling, like if any of these start overlapping, like, yeah. Honestly, like yeah. leaks could be like a week. Like if there's like a new ARPG launch that I want to play every week, I'd be fine with it. Like I honestly miss the time of the super short race seasons, right? Like where you got like mm -hmm. these two hour races and one hour endless ledge and stuff like that. Like if that was still a thing, I, I believe I would be almost exclu exclusively playing these short term events. So I don't see a problem with that. I also really like Torchlight Infinite as well. It took me ages to get into that because it looks like a stupid mobile game when you look at it, but it's actually pretty in depth and really fun. But like there's Pee Wee One, Pee Wee Two, Torchlight, Last Epoch. Everything's on three month cycles. There are four games I want to play at minimum. And that's without the release of any new things or playing any other genre or like wanting to delve into Diablo if it ends up actually becoming good or anything. That's like, I'm down to like three weeks a, a game pretty soon uh, and that's if they all line up perfectly <laughs> that might be a little different i tend to like to play a uh, league and poe one for about half the league cycle which you know in the four month leagues i guess it was about two months in and three month league would be about a month and a half i typically get uh quite you know fulfilling longevity out of an individual league so i don't know how i'm gonna handle it uh myself it, I, I don't feel like i'm gonna have enough time I think uh, just to answer your question earlier, Snoopy, I think for me, I'll probably be like a PoE 1 player. I just... You do? I, oh. I, I appreciate the direction they're taking PoE 2, but for me, the kind of player that I am, I'm a fan of the clown fiesta that is PoE 1, all of the ridiculousness <laughs> that exists in this game, I love. And it sounds like when I hear the... You know, I hear Mark and Jonathan talk about PoE 2, one, it's not like disparaging, but they do acknowledge that the game is oh, yeah. in such a state where it's tough to see what's going on. There's like a lot going on. It's it's just a lot. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just maybe different from what some people want. And I enjoy all of that and just the, just the sheer ridiculousness that is in Path of Exile because I can't get this anywhere else. I can't become, you know, if I think of PoE, I'm, I'm using Headhunter. I become the size of a house. I can barely see my character. I'm like, that's awesome. Like, this is the power fantasy that I play Path of Exile for. And that's just mm -hmm. what kind of a player I am. So I foresee myself playing primarily PoE 1 just for that reason, because I think that the games will diverge a little bit and that PoE 1 will have a little bit more ridiculousness and wackiness to it, you know, that, that makes it special. But at the same time, PoE 2 will be a little bit more measured in that regard. So to me, I think I'd enjoy PoE 1 a lot more. I would still be willing to bet anything that Snap and his whole team will still end up playing a week or two at least in oh, sure. every yeah, season. Of, of course, we'll still yeah. do whatever group shenanigan bullshit you can pull up with. It'll just of be course. more like, okay, it's Pee-wee 1 for like two months and Pee-wee 2 for like a month or something like that, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, we're always, I mean, we're going into an open mind. Like, of course, we'll play the both games, right? But uh, I just foresee in the long term, I think that for me, I would just enjoy yeah. Pee-wee 1 more just because just because of the ridiculousness. That's the the one thing I point to. It's intriguing to me. A lot of players in our audience, Snap, I'm sure you, you see this a lot from your audience, uh, people who are like diehard on the POE 1 train. And e even if, if you, as, as a content creator, if you even suggest that, oh yeah, POE 2 looks fun. I think we might do it. I might even switch to it. They're, they're like, 
You know, I can't believe you would say that. No, no, PoE 2 is not going to be nearly as fun as PoE 1. You have to play PoE 1. <laughs> I mean, maybe not to that extent, but I don't know. Are you getting that sentiment from some members of your audience? I mean, definitely. Like, I think the really easy, popular thing to do is to just, I don't know, shit talk PoE 2 because it's not PoE 1. But I think it'll just yeah, be yeah. a different pro- It'll be a different product entirely. And I'm not, I'm not super opposed to, like, the direction they're taking that product. I just think that... There's something really special in PoE 1, just the way it's all set up here. And I think that they're trying to take PoE 2 in a separate direction, which can still be good, just different than what exists in PoE 1. Um, I like yeah, everything I just, I've seen in PoE 2, except having to click a well to refill my flasks. That's not going to make it in, don't worry. Yeah, I, I think I think people need to ask themselves like what they play PoE for, right? If it's, for me, I play PoE because of just the crazy, ridiculous stuff that happens. And if you're that kind of player maybe you would enjoy PoE 2 a little bit less than you would PoE 1. But if you find yourself thinking like, man, there's way too much stuff on the screen. I can't tell what's going on. Like, this is bullshit. And you want a more slower paced, methodical gameplay, then PoE 2 is probably more of your alley. And I think maybe you need to identify what kind of player you yourself are before trying to make that determination, right? I would be torn on that. One, one tiny step further than that is uh, a lot of people think... That they that they'll join what Snap said. I'm sure a ton of people are like, yeah, yeah, I really enjoy the fast. But what you really actually enjoy is just being faster than everybody else, which is where I am, right? Well, I yeah, I enjoy the fast shenanigans, but I don't actually care how quick I'm going. Yeah. I only care that I'm going much quicker than the average. So for me, PoE two, okay, it becomes like a slower, more methodical game. My maximum speed is now a quarter what my maximum speed is in PoE one. But everyone else is running at half that speed. I still feel great. Like I only care that I'm going quicker and faster than the people around me, not what the actual speed is. Yeah, I, I just want to say, Baylor, you're one of the few people I've seen articulate that as clearly as, as I feel too. I, I I heard you say that one time before. I was like, "Yep, that's exactly how I feel." Like it doesn't really, really think have about it to until be. you said it. Does it have to be faster than other people or just could it just be like that power fantasy of starting at a low I'd pace and then getting the character people. faster and faster? Because, okay. I hate to sure. say it, but I think people want to feel some sort of superiority over other people. That's exactly like, what it is. I mean, yeah. you look at Last Epoch and this whole uh, Warlock thing with the Profane Veil giving all this ward and just the amount of envy that comes out of people when somebody else is playing something that's like OP, whatever. It's just crazy. Like you, if you're playing COF in Last Epoch, you should not give a single like fuck about what these people are doing with their warlock build and getting profane veil and all this ward. But it's the amount of like envy that people have when they are looking at somebody else doing something better, faster, or whatever than them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's just crazy and it definitely exists. Yeah, Last Epoch, I mean, is an example of of a scenario by which I I, I actually enjoyed my build so much I was comfortable knowing other people were doing way higher corruption. Uh, and and do and then that to me is a testament of just how much enjoyment I got out of the build more so than because I am like you guys are suggesting just like everyone else superiority complex or whatever uh, you know we see the build on YouTube we're like I want to move that fast why am I not moving that fast what do I got to do to move that fast oh I'm gonna move even faster than that I'm gonna come out with my own build you know that those thoughts cycle through my head constantly when I see that kind of stuff normally. How, sure. how much merit do you give to the what Jonathan or was it Jonathan in the most recent interview? I believe it was where, where he said that a part of the wanting to go fast has to do with the way that the game currently works in Path of Exile 1. As in, if, if you could fire while moving like you can in Path of Exile 2, you wouldn't feel the need to go as fast as you do in Path of Exile 1. Does it, is that something, is there truth to that for you? Or do you still think, oh, I'm still going to try and go as fast as possible? I mean, we kind of have that right now with Mirage Archer, right? And people do yeah. just still go just as fast with with moving yeah. while not having to shoot. And you just look at Mirage yeah. Archer, like this thing exists in PoE 1, right? So I don't know if that statement holds true or if I agree with it. Um, also, I don't know if it's a like superiority as much because like a part of wanting to go faster than everyone else, at the same time, I also go out of my way to try and teach other people to go that fast and like a lot of us do that as well it's not it's not so much it's hard to explain really like it's not 
I want to teach other people to get better as well, but I also just want to be faster than average by a significant portion. Oh, okay. That's really if, all that matters. If you don't want to be the fastest player, you want to be the best teacher then. How about that? Uh, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to, hard to figure out exactly. Like, the important bit to me is it doesn't matter to me at all if PoE 2 is a quarter the speed of PoE 1. As long as I'm still able to perform better than average. Still and then be help that, other people get better. So in last percentile. epoch, you cannot move as fast as in PoE 1, right? So Yeah, but that doesn't matter. You, you obviously didn't feel like that was a problem, right? A snap, did no. you and get less enjoyment, do you think, out of PoE or out of last epoch because you could only move so fast or whatever? Uh, I have a, I probably don't have a great perspective on this topic because I'm group play of using in last epoch. I, I mean, you can okay. in last epoch, yeah, yeah. you have one person that's like insanely fast and can fly through the monolith, and all you have to do is teleport onto him over and over again. So I'm like, I'm flying and <laughs> teleporting, and yeah, I'm doing yeah. crazy. So I, I maybe don't have the best perspective on that. I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, I felt I felt fine. I was plenty fast in that game. Just one zoomer and then five of everyone else in the group just yeah, that, that how it works. sound very that's, fun to me. Yeah. That's how it works in that game because you can prep your skill like in with Rune Master, you can spawn a bunch of plasma orbs and then you know you have somebody that's running the monolith and you warp in onto them and you just instantly blow up the screen like you can, as you warp in. It actually feels quite good. But yeah. Okay. Take your word yes. for it, I guess. <laughs> Does it get old? I mean, it got old at 3,000 corruption, which I think is a good amount of playtime. Fair enough. <laughs> now, yeah, I uh, saw a post already... on the Reddit. I was, yeah, sorry. No, no, please finish your thought. Well, I, I was just going to say, uh, I, I saw a post on Reddit. Some some person was complaining about how they didn't like Last Epoch. This is something like, after 200 hours spent in this game, I'm getting a refund. <laughs> this game's XXX, whatever. I'm like, after 200 the comments hours. Ra railed that guy. Bucks, calm railed down, buddy. <laughs> yeah. They were like, bro, you spent 200 hours and $35. What kind of value ratio are you looking for? <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's a side point. You see the Steam reviews with like 7,000 hours negative review? Do not recommend it. It's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a drug yeah, addict so I not recommending crack. I guess. <laughs> I was going to say that we're uh, closing in on the 140 minute mark and I'm very aware that you Snoobe have to be somewhere soon. So yeah, I was about, looking well, uh, yeah, about 30 minutes I would have to get off. Well, I was looking to uh, try and do like a closing round, something that I asked in the previous podcast and this is not the most sophisticated question, uh, but I think it's interesting to see how you're going to answer it and that's um with Last Epoch obviously breaking all expectations on the Steam performance, or not all expectations, but certainly some people's expectations, and definitely leaving its its mark. What uh, do you think are the right takeaways to take from that from that for other developers? Like, as in, what do you hope PoE and PoE two learns from Last Epoch? Is there something you hope Diablo four learns from Last Epoch? If there's any saving grace for that game. I'll go, I guess. Um, I take solace in knowing that Path of Exile developers actually play ARPGs. And, you know, we got we got a pretty eye-opening experience once in some sort of Diablo 4, I don't know, meet the developers thing. We got to see them play their own game, and it was really cringe to watch. Uh, I, I still remember that snazzy face snap. Uh, but... Um, yeah, it's not like that with Path of Exile developers. So I know that a vast majority of them were playing Last Epoch uh, to see what the com competition's like, to get inspiration, get ideas. I'm sure they had like roundtable discussions. Hey guys, we're gonna play Last Epoch. Let's come back with you know what are what are the three best things about that game you think uh, that exist? I'm I'm pretty confident that sort of thing went down, uh, you know, in the POE dev circles, and I have a great deal of confidence that uh, whatever they saw in there. Uh, they're going to like it. What I hope they don't take from it is uh, negative mana bricking your travel skill. Okay. Please, please don't implement that into uh, <laughs> PoE 
too because that drove me absolutely nuts in Last Epoch. But uh, just there were a lot the of travel things. skill that uses life. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that. That's fine. But um, the crafting system, great deal of inspiration could be taken from the crafting system. Of Last Epoch. Uh, it's different, obviously, but um, there are some things to really like about it, as well as combining, in my opinion, combining SSF and trade, having uh, different choices, and actually being able to implement them on the same server. And being able to flip back and forth is really cool concept that I saw Last Epoch bring about and uh, could maybe answer the age old question how do we deal with all these SSF players and trade players uh, doing two different modes, taking away from, you know, different economies and everything. I mean, they've already uh, said, yeah. they've, they've talked about specifically, like they already have inspiration from Last Epoch in regards to PoE2's like gold trading system, right? I mean, they, they specifically pointed out that like that's like somewhat other inspiration. I think after having played Last Epoch, I think there's definitely some like things that need to work out with the MG versus COF thing. But I think overall, like it was a huge success, and I am very, very hopeful that, that we might see something similar to that in the future in other ARPGs, maybe PoE. But I'm I'm sh sure they're taking other takeaways from the game, as Nube said. There's there's a lot of good stuff in Last Epoch for sure. Just a just a small note. Um, I actively played with a group as well the uh, whole like first week and a half two weeks uh we were all um cof we didn't do merchant guild like it's the reason that i want to point that out is because people keep calling the cof ssf and it's in no way related at all um we actively played as a group traded items between us multiple lp items that drop on the ground because we're cof that we have resonance we can trade between us because we were all playing together like nothing about it is Solo self found at all. It's just not access to the bazaar. That's all. I love. Good point. I kind Glad of love that. that. Yeah. In my it's mind, just... SSF means you cannot trade, and that's all it means. It yeah. doesn't have anything to do with playing with other players. We right? could trade. <laughs> we did. We did trade even oh, items that trade dropped. Players. Okay. Yeah. Even items that dropped when we weren't playing with each other were still able to be traded because of their resonance wow, trades. I didn't know that. Okay. Right, like if you play with long enough with someone, you gain resonance with them, and those resonance allows you to trade items that dropped when you weren't together as well. So, like, we were still able to be trade. Wow, I had no idea about that. That's actually one of the points that came up when we uh, did the podcast prior to the release that the resonance trading might become a problem, where you know you just trade with other people in the way that you farm up resonance with them together. Like so, it's a sort of RMT way of trading that they pay you to farm up the resonance with you and to give you their uh, to give them your item. Yeah, I don't. I think that that the abuse case is not very widespread because of how long it takes for you to get resonances. The obsidian ones take five, six, seven hours yeah. even of, of farming to get one, and that's just it is. You know, that's just that's a, a tall task or tall ass to get just for one item, right? I actually I'm have some to hear numbers on that. Um, uh, Regular resonance to trade like normal rare or exalted items or non LP uniques, like uniques with zero LP, those were dropping about every hour, hour and 20 on average the whole time. That was very, very commonly about an hour played with a person, you would get a normal thing. So we could trade a rare item or an exalted item or a non LP piece. But as soon as you go to try and trade LP items, when you need the big one, um, we were on average getting 10 of those per one. So it's about 10 hours of play together to get one of the golden resonance or whatever it was called, the higher number. It was about 10 to one the whole time, it just consistently with everybody I played with. So it's not, I just don't think that's going to become a problem. Who's going to go, oh, I want to buy this item. I will come play with you for 10 hours. <laughs> and then like, you know, if you're willing to go play with someone for ten hours to buy it, to buy an item off them, I guess good luck. Like I don't, then <laughs> they back out. Yeah, like, like never mind. Bye. <laughs> actually, I don't want to trade that anymore. But thank got a, you. I got a higher <laughs> offer, so I'm leaving. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> Next ten hours. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah. I'm something a little bit related to that. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Nick, because I think you were also MG that one thing Ellie did uniquely was you're unable to resell items you bought. I was curious how you thought that system specifically went over and how do you think that sort of a thing might function in POE if they were to do something like that? Your general yeah, thoughts? I've, 
Yeah, great question. I put uh, in my review, I mentioned that uh, flippers be gone. No more flippers, uh, no more price fixing. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's, that side effect alone is a huge benefit. And you could even argue the merits of no retrading just on that alone. You could. Uh, but uh, yeah, I liked, uh, I especially like the combination of that in conjunction with the crafting system being one where it, it eliminates items from the market and it creates item scarcity uh, that makes finding loot even more enjoyable, more fun, because loot has a lot of potential and you can actually have some sell value by virtue of so many items that are dropping, being removed from the market, potentially great items because people are constantly buying them, constantly attempting to craft on them, failing at most, occasionally hitting something big. And I made, I made just tons of sort of mid-tier sales on items that, you know, if that wasn't the case, the item, all these items I was finding were worthless. worthless. Yeah. yeah, and so I really, uh, really like that. I don't necessarily think, you know, POE should do that, but it was a different flavor. Yeah, it was a different thing, and, and I gained a, a nice appreciation. You think design. there are negative consequences to a system like this in POE, or what do you think that the arguments against something like that in POE? Well, I already said that you could argue on the merits alone. Uh, imagine POE marketplace with no flippers and no price fixers. Would you like I mean, that? That's, it's a benefit. I mean, yeah, I, I think I would like that. <laughs> yeah, but that's I mean, not negative, though. <laughs> But like, well, like uh, you said, you mentioned it. You don't right, think it right. should be something. What are the POE? negative side effects? So people are going to say, "Well, uh, what if I want to try a build? I want to buy something and want to resell it, uh, resell the item that I bought and crafted as a, ha a hand me down, and I can get a lot of value out of it, and it kind of work myself up." So the downside is that you, whatever you build, you have to commit to more. You're constantly trying out new builds, constantly trying out new gear uh, options, different things is going to feel really punishing. Uh, get, getting very, very partial or minor upgrades doesn't feel so good. You're going to kind of hold out for major upgrades more likely. So you would be more restrictive with uh, what you're trading mm. for. So that's the biggest downside, I think. That's fair. No, that's a good point. That's Definitely. A, so it's, it's... A, a second downside, I think, is that uh, there is a little bit of an issue, which I think, to be clear, I think the positives outweigh the negatives. I quite enjoyed in this game. I also do not think the POE should adopt that. And uh, you don't everything doesn't have to be the same. It's just it's fine for it to be good, but also different. But the other downside of that um is it's entirely plausible and was happening that there'd be 35 of a kind of item or a combination of mods or whatever somebody was looking for on the market. And because they can't resell the failures. The people who are very good trying to make the perfect thing will be like, ah, that was 80% of the way they're not good enough. And they buy the next one, they buy the next one, they buy the next one, and one person buys 40 items and then there are no more because they can't put their quote unquote failures back up. Right? So that's the other downside that I can think of. But mm. eh, I still think it's all right. That's, that's fascinating. I, I think in Last Epoch, it works because of the drop only mods. It's like a big thing. But Maybe it wouldn't work so well in PoE for a lot of those reasons. Yeah, that's probably right. Um, drop only kind of saving the novelty of, you know, really great items still dropping and being exciting to find as well. I mean, I we have those in PoE and I honestly hate it. Like, I hate uh, incursion mods. I hate delve mods. I hate that these exist in there and such. They're just so scarce and hard to obtain. So I think, yeah, I don't know why. The exclusivity I just like of where they come from is kind of yeah. bothersome, I guess. I think that's yeah. the thing that bothers me is it's just it's so specific. It's just like this one corner of the game that you can obtain these items in, and it's like not deterministic at all. So you're just really reliant on some dude picking it up randomly and then listing but it. But... Many many people say that's what makes the POE economy great. You can target farm something that exclusively drops from that source, and it has value because it exclusively drops from that source, well, and it's not like some well, crazy low drop rate if you target farm it. Well, are, are Delve mods target farmable in the same way that's like, I don't know, Blight is target farmable? I don't know that these two things are equivalent, I guess. I, I don't do Delve. I don't really know. Like... The delve nodes is like this is like something you get along the way, but it's not like you can go and target farm it. Like versus if I think of something like I don't know, uh, like what, what's the thing you can target farm in a mechanic like legion splinters? Like if I want to target farm legion splinters, and that 
that's like the thing I'm doing is farming that. I don't think these things are quite the same. And I, I don't know. I don't know how it applies to most other things because I don't do Delve anymore. And it's been a long, 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 long time since Spectres were meta and relevant as like League Star builds. But plus one Spectre chests come from Delve and they were always easily target farmable for me. Uh, when I was doing solo self runs and everything as well, solo self fan runs and everything, I always knew I would have a plus one Spectre chest because I knew I would just go to Delve and get one. And so I don't know if that is still the case because I haven't delved in a long time. I don't know if it's the case for all of the Delve specific items, but at least back then they were all quite easily target farmable. On like a good eye level on a good base, like it's so hard. It's, it's pretty it's random, rough. but yeah. I mean, I master, getting, like, a really game, getting a really good <laughs> one might have been different, um, but even in solo cell phone, just getting the mod I needed, the plus one Spectre, that's targetable. Getting a really good base at a really high item level that I can craft into a really good one, maybe not so much. But and at least the, pro- the, 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 was good. the problem is like the Spectre, plus one Spectre gives you so much power. Like you'd, you'd equip a really terrible chess piece with the mod on versus like something that's like yeah, even remotely it, decent. Too. That's well, the problem. Did. Yeah. Which kind of, you know, it, it brings back shades of the quantity thing. Like I'm equipping this piece of garbage just because this is like the only place I can get this mod, I guess. It's, uh, <laughs> quantity in this case. All for the interesting gearing decisions we have to make. Yep. But yeah, for the record, I really like Delve. I made a ton of money with Delve this league from all the people that didn't do Delve uh, but still wanted their Delve-specific mods. So, was yeah, I don't think game. you answered a question earlier, Catmaster. What was your your own question? My own question, oh. the takeaway that I want Path of Exile yeah. from Late Epoch. Oh, yeah. I was actually preparing for that, but now I forgot it. No, <laughs> never mind. No, I was saying um, we had this discussion a lot, so I'm going to cut it short. But like basically the availability of in-game information, like a wiki, and the availability of in-game editing options for an item filter, I really think should be there in Path of Exile. I, you know, I um, admit defeat in the point that... Uh, you know what the developers say is true, kind of, why should they put time into a system like that in the game when there's third-party stuff that does it better than they could ever solve it in-game? But I would really like to see not a replacement for the third-party stuff in-game, but more like a raising of the baseline that you get in the game without using the third-party stuff. I feel like that would be great if we could, similar to Last Epoch, just override existing item filters by adding a rule on top of them for example right like if we could just in game say oh i'm now right now i'm looking for an item that uh, is this base uh, evasion base a rare thing uh with this or that influence or whatever I, I don't know but it just doesn't sit right with me that realistically you can't play all of path of exile without using third party stuff I'm, I'm fine with the, the third-party stuff still being the best, but yeah. That mindset of developers saying, oh, well, why are we going to mess with a third-party? People could do it better than we ever could is is true. And it's also one of the reasons why I think people don't think PoE is a beginner-friendly game because there's just so few of these in-game systems that come naturally into the game it just overwhelms people. And by the time they're getting towards the end of the campaign, there's just way too much loot on the ground already. And they don't have any sort of sense of direction on, on things that could be changing in game and that would simplify, maybe simplify their experience or allow a more palatable experience, such as, uh, you know, a simple built in loot filter that could maybe manage uh, what their experience a little bit better. It just is one example. Console is interesting because I know on console, they provide you like never sinks mm-hmm. filter right by default. I'm just like wondering why they don't do that on the PC version of the client. Yeah, like, I think they should for, just for the new players. Uh, I don't see any because ne- it's, it's way better to have never sync, maybe not highlight something you want versus a new player being absolutely blasted with items and they're yeah. just overwhelmed. I mean, not even a new player. You or I couldn't level without a loot filter on. Oh, yeah, it's horrible. I, I just couldn't. I couldn't do it. I'm 20 something thousand hours into this game. And if you took away my loot filter, I don't know if I make it to max. So I'll be like, no, nah, I'm done. I think was... I made it to like halfway through Act One once without realizing I loop, didn't have a loop filter on, and I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, wait, something's not right here." I started and seeing I... way too much stuff. 
I felt this way in Diablo. It was honestly like the biggest reason I quit Diablo 4 was just the lack of loot filter and stashing. Like I just could not handle it anymore. I was like, there's upgrades my character could make, but I am just, I can't, I cannot do it anymore. And I'd imagine PoE players might, like new PoE players might feel the same way if they just don't know. Yeah, yeah. That, that's basically like just to be clear. I'm not asking for this uh, for myself, right? Like, I'm not saying I would play Poe more if those things were in Path yeah. of Exile. But I see from what they're doing that they l mm -hmm. would like to open Poe up to a wider audience, specifically Poe two. They want to lower the barrier of entry, and I think if you want to do that, then there should be some basic wiki in the game or some basic access to information of how things work. And uh, yeah, some item filter. That's one of the cool things with playing the new game is that we we are new new ARPG players again, and we sometimes yeah. forget what it even feels like to play a, a game like this brand new and like not know anything. It's fun to experience all the new things, and it can be overwhelming to try and figure <laughs> out everything from scratch. And I, you know, we got to see Ellie's take on that. It was pretty nice with all the different. Yeah, to things, be fair, Ellie just filter. just came out, right? It's like. Fairly complex, but it doesn't have that 10 years of feature creep that PUE has. Yeah. And similarly, PUE 2 is not going to have that. So maybe when PUE 2 comes out, right, they're already reducing the amount of items that drop and they're trying to, to fix that side of things. And maybe when PUE 2 comes out, there is no need for additional item filter editing in-game and for additional access to information because everything is so clear, right? But yeah. Who knows? I'm optimistic. I want PUE2 to succeed. Now, uh, we're probably at a point in time where it's good to end the podcast, and uh, I don't like to toot my own horn, but I will toot my own horn. But first, uh, you guys can toot horns that you'd like tooted. Uh, is there anything that you got baking that's going to come out before uh, PUE drops? Is there anything that you'd like to direct people's attention to? Want to go first, Snoo? Sure. Uh, elemental hits back on the menu, boys. Elemental hit. I'm gonna combine. Is that your official leak start recommendation? Yeah, I already, I already planned it. I already figured it out, and I don't think they're gonna nerf elemental hit in the patch notes. I swear to God, if they some for some reason did, <laughs> that would be really sad since it's not a popular skill. But uh, I want to combine reverse chill and uh, berserk through stunning warlord's mark cast on crit uh, mana forge setup like I did last league, and the way to do that would because it, you can't really chill and also stun at the same time. But you can if your arrows or if your attacks don't take the cold as an element. So suddenly you can get massive speed from both ends. So for anyone who likes going really, really fast, as fast as the game will let us, as Balor likes to say, uh, you might be interested in seeing my League Starter, which will come out uh, after the patch notes, obviously. I think you can. Well, I just want to say is one one final thing. Uh, really appreciated uh, Snap being on on here. Uh, it's great to to finally meet somebody who didn't think Calandra was the worst league ever. I gotta say, first of all, takes the top spot for me. But yeah, <laughs> uh, I appreciate you. Yeah, of course. It's been super nice having you know everybody on here. It's been a super interesting discussion. The thing I'll point to is uh, wait for patch notes. I don't have anything for you guys. Wait for patch. All right. Balor, I'm, you got anything? I'm testing a melee build for League Starter. It's Molten Strike. It might, and it, it's probably going to end up being a build guide that if it doesn't get gutted in patch notes. But Why realistically, it? it's all just practice and experimenting until patch notes because anything could happen. Like, for instance, um, Mana Forged Hour might get pretty heavily. Shout on. That's my big tip. Um, I don't think Mana Forged Arrow survives. This I thought I thought Mana Forged Life Tap was getting deleted yesterday, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's that's my uh my thought is that Mana Forged Arrow Life Tap thing is gonna disappear. Probably. I don't want it to, to be clear. I really like it. I I wanna keep starting dead eyes. <laughs> please, please don't touch it, but I expect it to go. That'd be such a quirky way for them to nerf bow builds. To wreck a lifetime manifold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I've started to uh, watch an old video from like six months ago where Exile 
get Steel back into speedrunning the campaign and I've tried to start writing down notes and identifying key points which I need to improve to be better at finishing the campaign quickly. And I'm probably going to share those notes in a video with like some editing and some tips and tricks what to do. Like specifically vendor walking, organizing your inventory while walking and stuff like that, right? Like just tiny little things that shave off like one or two seconds per area, but like in congregate, when you do all of them, they're really, really impactful. And uh, yeah, that's that's something that I'm currently busy with. I hope I can get something out before the end of the league. But yeah, I also just wanted to say that I really appreciated have, having you both on, guys. You probably noticed that I, I took a little bit of a step back at, at points and didn't really participate actively in the discussion because it was naturally flowing the way that I wanted it to flow and you were touching on the points that I wanted to be touched on and uh, I didn't mean to interrupt because, well, let's face it, the people are here to hear your uh, five head takes and not my <laughs> my idiotic input from someone who hasn't even One played. Head. Oh, yeah, well, half ahead, I guess. <laughs> Certainly when it comes to Last Epoch, uh, High Corruption, Monolith, Endgame, I, I do think I have some solid takes when it comes to Path of Exile, so I'll be more present on future episodes. But yeah, no, as far as like the high-end discussion goes, I really don't have that much input, but I appreciate it, it all coming together. And uh, yeah, at someone pointed out in, in the chat, you did a, a great... Uh, guest host Snoobe, like someone said that you seem more like a host than a guest at times. Uh -oh. And that was, uh, no, you asked great questions though and you kept the, the conversation flowing in a really nice way. So why should I'm I get in the I'm a second language learning teacher by profession. So my job is literally to be able to spur conversation with people who aren't so prolific at talking. So it just kind of comes naturally. Great. <laughs> well, uh, we're definitely going to benefit from that in one of the future episodes again. I'm sure we're going to see you again uh, like a couple weeks into the league when you're ready to share all your solo play findings and uh, rain on us with the, the, the golden strats. Um, we're going to have Snap back. You're going to be back uh, in like uh, just shy of two weeks from now when we want to discuss some league start options. We're also going to be joined by Subtractum for that specific episode. But before that, we'll have the reveal on the 21st and post reveal on the Sunday, I believe 12 p.m. GMT. So Sunday noon, we're going to be joined by Talkative Try and Dreamcast. Obviously past the, the, the after Talkative Try comes back from the LA event and from his interview so there's going to be tons of interesting stuff to talk about outside of the reveal and uh yeah looking forward to that there's also more episodes planned but i think I'd, that that's what i give you to announce now if you want to know the future episodes beyond that you're going to have to watch the next episode where i announce them how about that um yeah that's it if you've enjoyed the episode if you joined during the episode and you missed part of it, you could skip back. You could watch the thing fully on Spotify, listen to it on any podcast platform. And it will also be uploaded in full with probably somewhat improved audio levels and like little tidbits fixed here and there. Like when I dropped uh, my vaporizer from the table and make it made a big noise. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> probably going to be cut out on the Faded ARPG podcast YouTube channel that we're currently growing, where you can watch all the episodes. Uh, yeah as a sort of archive and currently without ads because the channel is not monetized yet. So look forward to that. And uh, that's all I got for you. Thanks everyone for being here. Have a wonderful day and uh, we'll see you for the next episode on the Sunday after the reveal. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Um, wait, no, I, I don't have it. Where's here, here. I know a lot of people want to send blankets or water. Just send your cash.